Good morning, everybody. I hope that you had a, a pleasant and relaxing evening and are energized for day two of the NIEHS Advisory Council meeting. Uh, we've got a, a, a full agenda for you that I think is going to be very exciting, uh, presenting a, a focus on, on PFAS, uh, as, as we alluded to yesterday. Uh, and I think given that the, the agenda is quite full, we'll just jump right in. Uh, and our first presentation this morning uh, is from Chris Ray, who is the Associate Director of the Agency uh, for Toxic Substances and Disease Re Registry at the CDC, uh, who's going to present an overview of uh, both the NASM report as well as some additional activities that ATSDR and NTH uh, have been doing on PFAS exposures. So with that, Chris. Yeah, thanks, David. I appreciate that. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Okay, great. So, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, nice to be here. Uh, uh, it, it's always exciting to me to be able to talk about the work we're doing at ATSDR around PFAS. It's, it's a major initiative for us here at the agency and for our sister agency, the National Center for Environmental Health. Uh, and and we, we have a lot going on in this space, so I want to give you a little flavor as to what's going on and then talk a little bit at the end about the NASM report and, and uh, then we'll bring it on home. So with that, uh, uh, I'm not going to read through this, but the traditional disclaimer that many of us in the federal government put out before, before we uh, do our presentations. And if you'd like a copy of that at a later date, I'd be happy to send it to you. <laughs> so I always like to go through the standard introduction of who ATSDR is and, and, and what we know about PFAS. And the reason I do is first ATSDR, we're a small but mighty agency. And, and many people uh, do not really know who we are. And, and I, so I like to start there. And then with PFAS, you know, as many of you know who are in this meeting, the science on PFAS is changing every month. And, you know, when you go look at the journal articles and, and what's going on, there's a half dozen to a dozen new articles and new findings almost every month. And so, I, I still like to talk about the introductory, do the introductory slides around PFAS. So if you, if you already know this, please bear with me. So a little bit about ATSDR. Um, uh, and I know many on the line know who we are. You've worked with us and you've been great partners, but we're an agency fairly young in the federal agency scheme. We were created through the Superfund and Circula or, or Circula Acts of 1980. And and we have a strong congressional mandate that we were given through these acts and, and through the SARA uh, reauthorizations. And our, our uh, a mandate tells us that uh, we should work in identifying human health effects of hazardous substances, especially as they relate to hazardous waste, and uh, that we should respond to environmental health emergencies. We conduct exposure assessments, community health assessments, various studies, and we provide gu guidance to state and local health department, par departments and with practitioners. But one of the interesting parts about our agency is Congress said, thou shalt work with communities. And, and that's one of the parts of, of the ATSDR mission that many people in the agency really engage with. And, and that is, we're always up in front of communities working with them, communicating with them to sometime try to teach them or, or relay to them risk information that may be very sophisticated. And that's a challenge, but, and we're always looking for new ways to engage communities, but, uh, uh, and, and how we can do things better. But, you know, that's, it's an interesting part of being with ATSDR is that we're constantly engaging with communities, either through our headquarters here at, in Atlanta or through our 10 regional office footprint across the country. We have some key strategies that we focus on here, here at ATSDR. The first is to build capacity. 
The second is to monitor and investigate hazardous exposures. The third is to provide science-based tools and resources. And finally, the fourth, which, all, which meshes in with our community engagement to conduct risk communication activities. So we all know what PFAS is. If you're in this meeting, you've probably been dealing with it for a long time. I'm not going to go through this. Uh, uh, basically, classic chemicals that were first uh, synthesized or found in the uh, late 1930s, early 1940s. And as many of us know, we uh, the PFAS compounds have uh, the fluorine carbon bond, which is one of the strongest bonds known in chemistry. And because of that bond, it gives these chemicals, whether they're long chain or short chain, some interesting properties around being resisting grease, being water repellent, being oil repellent. They are great surfactants. And, and they just provide a lot of, of characteristics that are desirable, you could argue are desirable in many consumer products. Anything from nonstick cookware, to cosmetics, to um, uh, uh, it, it, where I used to get my delivery pizza, there was a sheet that contained PFAS that kept the cheese from sticking to the top of the cardboard box and, and, and on and on. And, and so it seems like every few months we're finding a new, uh, a new application where PFAS is being used. PFAS can seep into water systems from factories, from landfills, and from various other sources. And again, because of that fluorine carbon bond and their affinity for, for uh, serum proteins, they do not re regularly break down in human bodies. And some of the longer chain have half-lives of years. And that's very concerning, especially when you consider some of the health effects that we're seeing uh, uh, in, in society today. Uh, here at ATSDR, we understand that PFAS exposure is a multifactorial exposure, but our, the information that we've seen suggests that drinking water is the main source of this exposure. But if you think about the, our food supply chain, uh, uh, the products that we use in our home, it is a, a, there are many routes of exposure and we've got some work going on here at EPA, here at ATSDR with our partners at EPA to better understand the different sources of exposure and what they contribute to the overall exposure and body burden that people face, especially in communities with contaminated drinking water. We also know that babies born to mothers who have been exposed to PFAS can be exposed during pregnancy and, and during breastfeeding, we still recommend that the benefits uh, to continue to breastfeed are far outweigh the, the, the consequences. Um, as a personal note, I was born in Northern Alabama, Decatur, Alabama, and lived there most of my childhood. And I probably got my first exposure of PFAS uh, through my mother uh, 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 from uh, breastfeeding. Um, uh, because as you know, in the Decatur and An Anniston, Alabama area where I grew up, there was a lot of PFAS contamination. In fact, my old elementary school is now a, uh, a, a PFAS contamination site. So the school was built right on the site, right on the landfill. So there's, there's many ways PFAS can get into our, into the environment and end up in, in our body. Some of these are more well known than others. Uh, 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 of course, the exposures through manufacturing releases and landfills are, are well known. Uh, uh, sludge from wastewater treatment plants, which are great fertilizers for farms. Um, uh, that sludge concentrates everything that comes through the wastewater treatment plant and hence the biosolids can contain concentrated PFAS. And when that, those are applied to the farm, the PFAS uh, compounds can get into the food that we eat and, and the water that we drink. Uh, 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 transportation is a source. Um, most of that is through firefighting foams in civilian and military applications. And as I mentioned earlier, there's a variety of consumer products that we all have in our homes today 
uh, that contain PFAS. So it, there's many different routes of exposure that uh, of, of contamination and exposure that can lead directly to um, uh, how we're exposed uh, both at home and at work. So, you know, a question we're always asked is, is how significant is, are these exposures? And, and in, in the UCMR3 unregulated monitoring rule uh, back in 2013, uh, we found that across the U.S. Uh, exposed, the U.S. population, we found PFAS levels greater than EPA in excess in, in more than 6 million people. And as you know, now we know through uh, uh, our NHANES testing, which I'll talk about later, and, and other UM, UCMR uh, 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 protocols, that we now believe that most everybody in the United States has been exposed to some extent. And, and there's data to show that upwards to 100 million people have had some level of, of significant exposure. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this slide. The health effects associated to PFAS, it, it, it impacts many different organ systems and physiologic processes within the human body. We're adding to this body of literature uh, uh, almost on a daily basis. Um, uh, much of what we know started with the C8 study in, in the Ohio, uh, Kentucky, West Virginia area. Uh, and we continue to add to this body of literature. And it's interesting because as the literature evolves, and as you know, there are some things that where we do not find effects, and there are other areas where we do find effects. So the ones that I listed are, are some of the effects that we're fairly confident about. But then there's this whole second tier of effects um, where we need more information uh, uh, and, and more scientific study in order to tease out whether the effect is real or not. The PFAS family tree, you know, people always ask how many PFAS are out there? Depending on who you talk to, it, that number can range from hundreds to thousands to tens of thousands. We typically here at ATSDR have settled that there are thousands of PFAS chemicals. There are short change and long change. There's PERS and polys. Um, uh, there's just a, a whole, there's just many different compounds, some that are used directly in products to give certain characteristics to the products and others that are, are compounds that are found at, uh, uh, as secondary byproducts. So a little bit of our a timeline uh, as to how ATSDR first got in, in CDC, first got involved in PFAS. In 1999, that was the first time that our NHANES group started looking at PFAS in the general U.S. population. And as that is, has evolved, we, we now know that 98%, uh, greater than 98% of the serum samples collected through our multiple NHANES sampling periods, greater than 98% of the samples collected contain some level of PFAS, detectable level of PFAS compounds in them, uh, which again goes back to the, the, the concept that the exposure is that exposure is widespread. It, uh, in 2000, and, and, and after this finding, we started getting more and more petitions and requests for community health assessments across the country, and we still do today. In 2009, we, re we released our first tox profile related to PFAS, which has been updated several times in 2012-2013. UCMR3 came out in 2015. We updated the profile. 2016, EPA announced their lifetime uh, health advisory for PFOA and PFOS in drinking water. In 2017, ATSDR added PFOA, PFOS, PFNA, and PA, PFHXS to the substance priority list. In 2018, um, we updated our TOX profile again, and we added uh, PFAS community water system indicators to our uh, NCEH, National Environmental Health, Public Health Tracking Network. 
And we also designed a tool called the PEAT, which I'll discuss a little later, um, which, is a, which is an interesting tool that you can download from our website. Uh, but it is a tool to guide anyone that wants to do biomonitoring for PFAS and to determine exposures through biomonitoring. It, it provides them with a protocol and with recommendations as to how to conduct that type of assessment. And, and again, it's, it's available on our website. Anyone who downloads it and would like uh, uh, some assistance in how to use it, we're more than happy to help. And we've pilot tested it in communities in New York and, and Pennsylvania, which I'll talk about a little later. In 2019, we began our exposure assessment project, which uh, we received uh, funding from Congress to conduct no less than eight exposure assessments in communities near current or former military bases where the source of exposure to the community is believed to be from that military base. And we've now completed 10 of those exposure assessments, which again, I'll, I'll briefly touch a little later. We also began a large uh, health study where we examined health effects from contaminated drinking water in the Pease Trade Port community, which is in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, which basically was the pilot study for our multi-site study, which is now launched. And we have recruitment ongoing at the seven multi-site sites across the country. And then finally, in 2021, we released a, a, a final tox profile for uh, uh, PFAS, where we set MRLs for PFOA, PFOS, PFHXS, and PFNA. And as you would expect, with the way the literature is evolving, how rapidly it's evolving, we've already started looking at how uh, at updating not only the MRLs for those compounds, but also uh, establishing MRLs for other PFAS compounds, where through our systemic review process, we feel we have the right amount of information to come up with an, a, a new MRL. And finally, just a, a little bit with about NHANES. Uh, NHANES monitoring, uh, our, our, the CDC National Biomonitoring Program. Uh, uh, we really started in 2019, uh, and PFAS have been measured in blood samples through this. Uh, uh, since then, uh, uh, NHANES has been used in many studies and by many investigators. Some of the common uses are tracking temporal trends determining who is exposed, setting reference ranges, identifying sources, and monitoring interventions. And, and just a little data from the NHANES data that we feel is always important to think about, that when you look at PFAS in children, uh, uh, back in 2013, 2014, EPA worked with industry and, and to phase out the use of PFOA and PFOS in uh, uh, in products in in manufacturing here in the U.S. and that has occurred, but we still have those compounds detected in children born after the 2013-2014 time period, which uh, again reflects the long half life and the transfer of PFAS compounds to the uh, to the developing fetus and the newborn child. Uh, 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 from the mother. And, and we're also still finding PFHXS and PFNA in children. So ATSDR's PFAS initiatives. First, a quick map for, of currently where we are. This is a combination <laughs> of our PFAS exposure assessment sites, those, those 10 sites that I previously mentioned where we assess PFAS exposures uh, in communities where the source of exposure is believed to be a current or former military base. Also, our, our multi-site study locations through our cooperative agreement with the Portsmouth, New Hampshire, or Pease community, and with seven other sites uh, across the country. And then also the community health assessment work that we're doing uh, here at ATSDR through our petition process, uh, the PEAT pilot sites, and through work that's being performed uh, either co-led by ATSDR or a state or, 
or through or through or being led by the state across the country through our cooperative agreement program, which many of you know as Apple Tree. So we really think about a uh, um, uh, we really think about our PFAS, our major PFAS work, the exposure assessment, the P study, and the multi-site study in this triangular format because each one builds on each other. I mentioned the PEAT uh, 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 tool, which uh, the PEAT tool was designed to be the protocol for the exposure assessments. So even though Congress said to conduct exposure assessments in no less than eight, in no less than eight um, sites, we actually talk about 10 sites because New York and Pennsylvania were, were the states where, with communities where we pilot tested the PEAT. And then there were eight additional sites after we completed those pilot tests. So we now have 10 sites. Uh, you can go on our website if you're interested in on our PFAS homepage, just Google ATSDR PFAS and you can download, see the data from those sites. We also have reports out, site-related reports, which I believe may be available on the website now. If not, they will soon be posted. And then we have finalized a summer report of all 10 sites and all the findings from 10 sites that has cleared, cleared clearance and will be published very soon, uh, probably by the middle to end of next month. So we're excited to get that out and to share that with with our partners, both in the federal government and the states and with communities across the country. The exposure assessment work also led us to the P study, which is our real first effort outside our community health assessments, where we looked at PFAS exposures and non-cancer health outcomes in one community and being the PEAS community. And that study the protocol built on what we learned through Pete and through the exposure assessments. The P study recruitment is completed. Uh, we're analyzing the data as we speak. We're hoping um, uh, next year uh, in 2023 to be able to share the results from the P study publicly. Um, uh, I, I don't really have any nuggets to share with this group at, at this stage, but it, it, it be on the lookout for it. Uh, but the, the importance of the P study is that, again, like with the PEAT and the exposure assessments, the protocol was built in a way to help inform how we do our multi-site health study, the, our cooperative agreement study. And, and the multi-site study was awarded in 2019 to seven uh, uh, principal investigators at seven different sites across the country. Uh, they began recruiting um, uh, this year, and recruiting is ongoing. Our goal is to have 7,000 um, adults and 2,000 children in the final cohort, and that includes the P study participants. So that will be an eighth site in the overall uh, multi-site health study. And we're looking at various uh, uh, non-cancer endpoints in this, so lipid metabolism, we're looking at immune factors. We're looking at some developmental factors and for the, the children's side of the cohort. And this study is about two years away from being completed. So we continue to go for, push that forward and we'll definitely provide updates when we can. So uh, just a little bit about the exposure assessments. A lot of this I've already talked about. Um, uh, uh, the important part here is on the right, which are the communities where we, the 10 communities where we conducted the exposure assessments. The first two were the pilots for the PEAT study in Berkeley County, West, I'm sorry, I said New York, it's Berkeley County, West Virginia, my fault. Um, and then Bucks and Montgomery County in Pennsylvania. And then we uh, proceeded in uh, El Paso County, Colorado, Fairbanks, Alaska, Hamden County, uh, Massachusetts, Lubbock, Texas, Newcastle County, Delaware, Orange County, New York, Spokane County, Washington, and West Hampton, New York. And uh, uh, we have over 2,000 adults in this from the 10 selected sites. 
And it, it's interesting data because some sites have, it's not an, each site by site, the findings are not the same. And in some sites, certain compounds will be higher than others. In the Delaware site, uh, there are contributing factors from the fact that the community is also near a factory. It's, it's downstream from a factory that used PFAS for years. Um, so not only was their exposure probably through contamination from that factory, but also from the nearby uh, uh, military base. And again, if you're interested in seeing how this how the data falls out by site, if you Google ATSDR PFAS, uh, there's a, a link to our exposure assessment homepage, and you'll be able to download some of the graphs and information from that data. The, the Portsmouth, New Hampshire, again, this became the basis for our, uh, uh, our multi-site study. And, and we looked at it as a seven-prong process, starting with community engagement. And in and, and, and Portsmouth is interesting because we have a very uh, engaged community group, community action group uh, that works closely with us through this. And, and they've been great partners, not only in, in, in providing us with access to the community, but they've been very active in helping us with recruitment making sure messages get out and, and doing anything that they can do working together hand in hand with us at ATSDR to get the study completed. Data collection and analysis has been completed. We are in the, the step five, we're in the process of getting individual results out to the participants in the community. And, uh, uh, and then after all the results are out, we're, we will soon hold a community event where we'll discuss what we found with the community. And then uh, sometime in 2023, we're hoping to uh, uh, publish the results. So, it, it, you know, it's been an interesting time in recruiting for these studies, including the multi-site study and the exposure assessments, because we've been doing this in a COVID environment. And uh, one of the things we found early on is, is, is that the traditional uh, shoe leather epidemiology going and knocking on doors and engaging directly with people uh, where they work or where they congregate has been our best method to get people involved. And that's been difficult in, a, in the, during the pandemic. But we, we've pushed forward with every chance we, we get, and, and we believe we've, we've done everything we can to really shake the trees to get as many participants as possible. The multi-site study, uh, again, on the, uh, the part on your left, I've talked quite a bit about um, the health endpoints. I, I'll just briefly go over that again. We're looking at lipid metabolism, kidney function, thyroid disease, liver disease. Uh, glycemic parameters and diabetes, and also immune response. So the study is not designed to do look at cancer, but we do have some other efforts on the NCEH side of our house where we're doing some ecologic analysis looking at cancer using existing data that we're hoping to have published in the next uh, uh, year and a half to two years. Um, uh, to give us an I to give us an idea of where to direct further studies more detailed with larger cohorts uh, related to cancer. On the right are the sites where we're conducting the studies. As you will see, there is some overlap between this and the exposure assessments. That was not necessarily planned um, when we uh, started funding, providing the grants through our cooperative agreement. But it, it is interesting because in many of these sites, many of the participants have already more than one serum sample that we can use as we do the analysis over time. So in, in certain sites, you know, you may run across a study participant who had their serum tested two or three years ago, four years ago, and then they've been tested again, maybe two years ago, and now they're going to get tested again as part of this study. So it's really providing us with an opportunity to have more, a more robust analysis. And then finally, I, I added this slide in. We don't talk much about this, but 
I, I, we, uh, I do like to, I, I think this is a good group to talk about. At ATSDR, we have many work streams going on related to PFAS and many products and projects. And so we've created a PFAS community of practice at, at ATSDR. We meet on a monthly basis and it's open to anybody who has an interest in the work we're doing. So it's attended by our regional offices because many times there they field questions. It's agency leadership, it's the project officers, uh, it's our comms people, our policy people, in, anybody who's interested. And we go over in fairly significant detail all the work that we're doing, where it is, and we engage across functions and a, across our, our, our focus areas in, in a manner that really helps facilitate the work and, and, and allows us to, uh, to discover or uncover opportunities to further push the agenda. One of the things we're doing through our community of practice, uh, you may have seen uh, a, a, a paper published by Rachel Rogers on uh, uh, how we at ATSDR see our PFAS research agenda, see a PFAS research agenda. It has four focus areas. Um, the paper is not designed to just say this is what ATSDR is going to do. It was really us taking a step back and, and thinking about what's the work that we would like to see done. And, and so some of it is, is work that we feel ATSDR would be the right place to do it. Others would be work. Uh, some of the work was uh, work that we uh, think others in the federal family or the academic community uh, uh, should look at it. Came out about a year ago, so if you if you look up Rachel Rogers, and uh, uh, you should be able to find it. Um, but this was all developed through our community of practice. We, in our community of practice, we've had other federal partners come and talk to us. We had FDA come and and provide us with a presentation and a, a really robust discussion on the use of PFAS in cosmetics, for instance, and. Uh, we also have NIOSH as part of our community of practice as, as we are partnering as close as we can with them on some of the workplace studies that they've started to initiate through their mandate. So the National Academies report, um, uh, uh, if you haven't seen it, I urge you to go online and download it and take a look at it. It just hit the public realm about a, a little over a month ago. Uh, we have physician guidance on our website that we've provided a few years back. It's about a 20 page document. It's fairly detailed and, uh, and, and it's how we saw, uh, clinical guidance for physicians at that time within the parameters of our mandate and what we can do at, at ATSDR and recommend as a federal public health agency. Many of our community partners um, uh, were, have been pushing us to go further with this. And in order to understand how we could go further, we, uh, our, uh, ATSDR and in, in, with in, NIEHS, which were, was a great partner in this process, and with some of the communities, uh, uh, enlisted uh, NASM to conduct an independent review of the evidence regarding human health effects from PFAS exposure, with the outcome being to inform clinical care of exposed patients, including women and children. Um, the report's now out. Uh, we're currently examining the findings. In fact, we, uh, we have a pretty big meeting tomorrow here within the center uh, to talk about uh, the findings and what our next our, what are our next paths forward? We, we feel that over the next few months, this report is going to really impact the way we think about clinician guidance across the country. And, and, and we'll be uh, subsequently changing our guidance uh, as a result of this. Uh, when you look at the report, it provides an objective review of the current evidence. Uh, regarding human health effects of PFAS. And, and the objective review is we, we've, really, uh, we, we've really found value in it. And they've, they've said that there are some, thing, some findings, some health impacts that we're so certain with the data that we feel they're real. There are some 
where they're interesting findings that require more research. And then there are some where they where we have found that no no level of uh, that where we have found that does doesn't appear to be uh, have a health impact. Um, uh, based on this, they have provided options on in or decision making on when to test PFAS in blood, um, uh, uh, and and they've also talked. They also talked about appropriate patient follow up and care specific to some of these better known health endpoints for those patients. So where did the committee find sufficient evidence of an association between PFAS exposure and, and health outcomes? The first was in decreased antibody response in adults and children. Many of us, if you've been working in PFAS for any amount of time, you're familiar with this finding. Uh, also, the, the lipid metabolism results, and there's more data coming out on this, and it's something that we're studying in our multi-site study, uh, sufficient evidence for that. Decreased infant and fetal growth was found, uh, which is an interesting finding because even though they found this, it, when you look at things that require more research, uh, that was whether the decreased infant and fetal growth factors actually result in adverse birth outcomes or adverse developmental outcomes. And, and going that next step still remains to be seen. And then finally, the increased risk of, of, of kidney cancer in adults um, uh, uh, was a, a, they found sufficient evidence. So the study found it limited or suggestive evidence of an association for increased risk of breast cancer in adults, for liver enzyme alterations in both adults and children, increased risk of pregnancy-induced hypertension, increased risk of testicular cancer, which was also a finding in the C8 study, thyroid disease and, and thyroid dysfunction in adults, and in, an increased risk of ulcerative colitis in adults. So again, areas that are driving us as we think about at ATSDR PFAS 2.0, so to, so to speak, to be trite for a minute, where can we expand our work to provide more information to take some of these areas where there's limited or suggestive evidence and either provide information that pushes us more towards the, yes, we think this is a real health effect or tells us, no, this may not be a, a, a real health effect. So a little update on our tox profiles and, and where we are with this. Um, uh, 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 publishing, doing tox profiles, doing the work, publishing them is part of our mandate. And, and uh, the, the basis for this is that any chemical substance found on the national, the MPL uh, list is, is, uh, gets a tox profile. And then we also, uh, have a petition process where people can petition to have other substances or chemicals uh, uh, added to our list of tox profiles to be developed. As many of you know, there, there, it's a, it's a, it's, it's a long process with a lot of reflection and comprehensive and extensive evaluation. We engage many partners in the process, and they really provide a, a good interpretation of available toxicologic and epidemiologic information on a substance at a certain point in time, which that's important to say because as I mentioned earlier with PFAS, there's new information coming out uh, uh, weekly, if, monthly, if not weekly. And so how do we make keep our tox profiles uh, uh, up to date in, in germane for the public health community? And, but what ends up happens for priority substances like this, we, in, we are in a constant phase of, of publishing a profile. And while one is being published, we're already starting the work to update that profile. And in the case of PFAS, to look at the, the MRLs that we already have and to uh, uh, look at substances where they're not MRLs, but there's evolving information, which may meet our threshold to where we can develop a new MRL. Uh, uh, so 
when sufficient data exists, ATSDR derives MRLs. We currently have MRLs for, as I mentioned earlier, for PFOA, PFOS, PFNA, and PHXS. In the new update uh, that we're hoping to have out um, early next year, there will be possible changes to those sub the MRLs for those substances and because of new data and literature, and that we'll be adding more, uh, more information. You know, a little bit about what an MRL is. You know, when you think about MRLs are designed to, uh, to help ATSDR community health assessors and scientists determine where to prioritize when they're doing an, an assessment of an exposed community. And if you think about a hazardous waste site that may have hundreds to thousands of chemicals in it, uh, we use the MRLs as a way as to what to prioritize. It is an estimate of the amount of chemical a person can eat, drink, or breathe without a de detectable level of risk. It looks at most sensitive populations, so the elderly, uh, uh, infants, uh, uh, unborn fetuses are, are uh, part of that evaluation. Um, they're developed for health effects other than cancer. Uh, we, we, uh, though we do discuss cancer and consider it in developing MRLs, uh, we do not make a judgment as to whether something is a carcinogen or not. We leave that to folks who are better geared to do that work, such as IARC, WHO, uh, the EPA, um, NIOSH to some extent, and our, our partners at uh, NIH, in, in NIHS. We, you can convert MRLs to drinking water concentrations for an, uh, adults and children, and we have those published on our web, website. We call them Environmental Media Evaluation Guides, or EMEGs. It is important to note, and we say this frequently, MRLs and EMEGs are not intended to define cleanup or action levels. Again, we leave the development of those. Uh, uh, we leave the development of those to uh, other parts of the federal family and the states uh, uh, where they decide to act to develop those cleanup and action levels. But again, they're they're used by they can be used by public health professionals to to decide how to prioritize where to look when you're looking at environmental contamination and how it impacts an exposed community. So just quickly, and again, you can go on our website and download these. Here are the MRLs and EMEGs for the poor, four PFAS compounds in our current uh, uh, tox profile. So there, there's a lot of work going on in the EPA. I just wanted to quickly touch on this. Um, uh, uh, just because we're all involved in this and, uh, the UCMR5, uh, uh, um, is going to be rolling out soon. They're going to be looking at 20, 25, 29 PFAS compounds. Uh, this will be occurring between 2023 and 2025. So we're excited about that. They've also published a final determination to regulate PFO and PFOS. And uh, EPA published a final human health toxicity assessment for some of the Gen X compounds. Uh, uh, and I know we've got some partners here from North Carolina where Gen X is, has been, in, Gen X exposure and contamination has been very impactful. So I, I'll leave that discussion for them. So we have many tools for PFAS on our website. And uh, so I recommend you go there, take a look. If there's something that you're interested in having and you don't see, give me a call, drop me an email, and we'll see what we can do. We have some other tools that are in different levels of development right now. One is a, a, uh, a water to serum converter based on some pharmacokinetic modeling that we've been doing here at, at ATSDR. Um, uh, we're always looking at how to improve, augment, or innovate in the space of how do you communicate PFAS exposure uh, to communities and to people. It's a very complicated exposure. It's many times a mixture. Many times there's parts of that mixture that, uh, uh, that we may not be able to identify at this stage. And so how do you talk about risk with people in communities? And that's something we're... 
we're continually trying to improve and to find new ways. So with that, thank you very much. Uh, I, I'm really honored to be here and to talk about this. Uh, you know, here at ATSDR, we have a real passion around PFAS and in helping communities navigate this important exposure. You, you know, one of the things that I always like to close with is when you stand in front of communities and talk about this, there's a lot of anger out there because, they, you know, they've been ex unwillingly exposed. And, 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 and it's sometimes it's really tough discussions because they, they, they want answers and we're trying our best to get them answers through our mandate and the processes that we have. And we're more than willing to partner with any state, local health department, uh, any community group who is trying to navigate these difficult communications uh, uh, with the people that they serve. So with that, thank you very much, David. I think I turn it back to you. Is that right? Indeed. Thank you, Chris. That was a great presentation. Uh, I learned a lot. We were actually having a discussion recently whether we had enough pharmacokinetic data to do the extrapolation between drinking water and, and predicted uh, burden. So glad to hear that you have a tool that allows us to do that. Yeah. Uh, and, and David, there's going to be two publications coming out very quickly. They've both been cleared. Uh, Rachel Rogers, who I know you know, uh, is the lead author on those. And Moise Montez has been doing a lot of work here, which I know some of you know, on looking at PFAS mixtures and, and how do we think about PFAS as a mixture versus just as individual compounds. Yeah, that's great. So we, we do have a couple of council members who are queued up to, to ask questions, and I'm sure that there will be more. Just a reminder to council members, please use the raise your hand function uh, so that we can, can moderate the discussion. And we'll start off with Tim. Yeah, this is Tim Greenemeyer. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes, yes, okay. I can. Um, without having read the full NASM uh, report, it doesn't appear that there are neurologic outcomes that have been assessed. Uh, is that the case? And is there any plan to look into neurologic outcomes? Yeah, so uh, thank you for that question. Um, you, you are correct. Uh, some of the out, most of the outcomes that they're assessing are things that have common that are already being accessed. For instance, if, if you have a child of a certain age that has a high level of, uh, of PFAS, start looking at lipids, uh, uh, cholesterol, and things like that. But um, we do have neurologic outcomes in both our P study and our multi-site study. Uh, the children involved in those studies are, go through a, a battery of neurologic tests. And uh, when we publish the P's findings, uh, I believe it's going to be in 2020, later in 2023, um, we should be able to provide some more information related to that. It'd be interesting also to look at um, uh, late onset uh, adult diseases, neuro neurodegenerative diseases. Yeah, that, you know, when we talk, so great, thank you for asking that. When we talk about PFAS 2.0, that is on our list. And, and you know, at ATSDR, we have, we also are the owners of the National ALS Registry. And it's not only a registry of, of ALS patients in this country, but also a biorepository that has everything from blood and uh, from serum blood, uh, urine, to also, um, in some cases, whole sets of of uh, a nervous system, you, you know, brain, spinal cord, um, from certain ALS members, ALS uh, patients who have now passed away and have donated that to our biorepository. So through that, we also have an ability to facilitate some of that work. Thank you. That's great. Um, Marla, I think you're next. Hi, everyone. I just have a thank you for the presentation. Uh, awesome, awesome presentation, very informative. But I would like you to expand on the um, um, public engagement dimension. And, uh, and I wanted to know in particular, if from the specific products that you have produced, uh, there are products directed towards uh, uh, you know, specific community needs instead of just the researchers. 
Yeah. So it, yeah. It, so it, it, great question. Um, and the answer is yes. So, uh, uh, and if you're looking for something specific, give me a, 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 a ring, look up my email. If you want me, I'll put it in the chat. Um, be happy to help with that and possibly even work with, with you to design something specific. We, most of our work is designed for engaging with communities, with people in communities. We do do some engagement with researchers and some scientists and have tools and products around that, but most of it is around that. We also have, uh, 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 within ATSDR, we, as part of some of our strategic priorities, we really want to go big in community engagement science. And we've set up a new section within ATSDR. Um, uh, Don Fowler, who's a who's an incredible subject matter expert in community engagement science, is leading that. We're staffing up the team. We have a strategy in place to look at how can we improve the way that we engage uh, 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 communities and what are some opportunities that are missing it. How do we engage communities that have that are I, 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 lack of a better word? I'm just going to use the words that come to my brain is non-traditional U.S. cultures, so a, a Hispanic community, or um, my, my wife is Filipino, and, and she, uh, uh, how you engage on, how she engages on things like health and medical information is very different from how I do, <laughs> and, and so how do we really get these difficult messages in the hands of people in community in, in a way that's in fact effective where they can understand and so we're, we are constantly working on that. Again, for the partners here on the call, if you have a, a need or something where we could help, we'd be more than happy to uh, uh, entertain that conversation. Okay, thank you. Uh, Trevor, I believe you're next. Uh, hi, this is uh, Trevor Penning from the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, so I really enjoyed your talk, Chris. Uh, it was very sobering uh, to hear about the very low levels of, of PFAS chemicals and the health effects that, that you've been seeing. I actually put in the um, a chat uh, 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 a connection to a publication that just came out of our center. And it was actually a way to try and capture some health effects by doing what we would call reverse epidemiology. So as you know, um, Willow Grove, uh, a naval air base in Horsham, in Horsham which is uh, part of the, I think, community you first looked at in Montgomery and Bucks County, uh, is a high PFOA or PFAS exposed population. And so what we did was we looked at uh, electronic health records to actually look at disease incidents in women from uh, that area versus adjacent area where there was no exposure. And we actually identified uh, signals for many of the health effects you've seen. We were actually measuring any PFOA in these individuals. We saw evidence for hypercholesterolemia, thyroid disease, kidney malfunction, et cetera. And uh, we could do this because we're part of a large health system. So I'm just wondering if this, if this is another way you could capture the health effects of uh, PFAS chemicals. And, and at Penn, we have a biobank. So we actually collect blood from all patients coming in. So we have a, the means probably to go back and look at these individuals now for PFOA or PFAS exposures. Yeah, you know, you know Trevor, uh, uh, thank you for asking that. Um, so, uh, or, or making those comments. We are we are still we're spinning up our ability to look at electronic health records. You know, it's a little more cumbersome at the federal government to do that than it is in the states, of course, or at a university setting. But we've been we've got a pilot study going on in our NCEH side of the house, uh, 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 working with Delaware on on how can we start doing reverse epidemiology and using electronic health records. And uh, uh, I'm, I'm gonna reach out to you later because I think that would be a great discussion to have with our community of practice. And yeah, I, uh, go ahead. 
Yeah, I could put you into contact with the bioinformaticians that did this uh, 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 to talk about how to mine a EHR if that's helpful. That, that would be very helpful. And I think, you know, you'll have in the room everybody that's doing anything PFAS related at CDC, ATSDR, NIOSH. Um, you'll have in the room the, the scientists who are leading our kind of our PFAS 2.0 effort, um, where I know they're thinking about this. And I can even add in our the people from the NCEH side of the house who are doing this pilot looking at how can we better use an electronic health records to do reverse epidemiology. I think it'd be a great discussion, very welcome, very timely, and uh, let's talk later. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, Daryl, you're next. Oh, thank you very much. Um, hi, Chris. Good to see you again. Um, yes, sir. Um, from, I guess, we go back to Meharry Medical College, where that funding from ATSDR was seminal um, for those multi-generational studies we did with Benzo Pyrene. Thank you for that. Um, but um, I'm at Ohio State now, and um, 20 years at Meharry. I've been here 10 years um, now, and so it was seen that I was wondering if ATSDR was aware that it seems that based on the litigation um, with regard to PFAS compounds over the past couple of years, seems that the primary exposure stream that's um, harming communities uh, of color is coming from landfills. That's based on the litigation around the country. And um, certainly uh, I was wondering if ATSDR had any thoughts on that. I saw you spoke about your um, MRLs, but, you know, you know, it's MCLGs, you know, maximum containment right. level guidance right. and the MCLs themselves. And so um, I like the community engagement piece, um, but but can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so, uh, you know, when you put together a presentation like this, you make decisions as to what to include and what not to include for a given okay. audience. And, and what didn't make the cut, which, boy, I struggled with this, was our environmental justice index, which okay. I don't know if you're familiar with that. But yes, it's just, of, course. of course. Yes, sir. Okay, so it just came out. And, and uh, we are doing a study right now looking at where we know PFAS contamination is where hazardous waste sites are and where the EJ communities are related to that. And- uh, uh, Because and, none of them were on that map that I just saw you show. And, and that's, well, because we just started it. You know, okay. we just yeah. rolled out the index and we're just doing it right now. So you are correct. They're not on the map. And in fact, when you look at the places where we're doing our work and look at the data in the EJI, uh, we believe there's some opportunities for communities from other exposure pathways, as you say, uh, for us to have a, a different view or lens on how we select communities and, and not just, you know, right now, you know, truth be told, uh, we have a drinking water focus, um, uh, but there's, there's also this whole side of, of hazardous waste sites and how that contamination impacts. So we're doing that analysis now. Um, uh, we'll, uh, I suspect sometime in 2023, we'll be able to share that. Uh, but it's, it's a great point because we now have the tools um, where we can look at where, um, I always hate to say EJ communities because I don't think they, you know, if I lived in an EJ okay. community, I don't know if I'd want to be called an EJ community, <laughs> um, but it is a fact of life. And uh, 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 but how how we can look at places where there's known PFAS contamination, known hazardous waste sites, and and how does that match up to where we're saying our index says a community has environmental justice concerns? Thank you very much, and be be happy to talk further. Oh, well, sure thing. I'll like drop you a conversation. Line. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, Andre, uh, if we could do this fairly quickly so that we can move on to Brian's presentation. Uh, you're muted. My question is quick. The answer may be long. 
Uh, <laughs> what, in yes, your sir. opinion, would be the critical next steps? The critical next steps. Boy, that is a long answer. So I, I think getting a better handle on what total exposure looks like and not just drinking water, I think, is a critical next step. And and really understanding how these different exposure pathways, whether it's through food, air, uh, consumer products in our home, how they contribute to the overall exposure. Also understanding the role of mixtures in producing health effects and all of these, you know, when you talk to the folks like out in Colorado who have a subject matter expertise in looking at fluorine compounds in water and in serum, they'll say that you know, what we're measuring by looking at 16 or 17 PFAS compounds only accounts for 25% of the fluorine in the body. And so what does that mean is, is going to be important. Um, doing the right cancer studies, I think is going to, you know, cancer studies are expensive. They're hard to do, but it's the right work. I, I think we've got to start thinking about that in a more serious way. Um, uh, the other part that we're interested in is this whole, uh, uh, that we're real interested in is this whole, um, uh, uh, mother, child, mother, developing fetus, child, um, uh, continuum and getting a better idea as to how that plays out, especially developmentally later for the child. We think that we also think that's very important. So. Just off the top of my head, that's where I would go with that. Yeah, and I will we'll have the panel discussion where I'm sure that this is you know part of the topic that we'll be talking about there as well because I think there are a lot of a lot of future directions that we'll need to explore. Yes. Uh, so the the next hour, what we're going to do is is um, have three presentations, um, and we're going to hold questions on those unless there's one or two really um, kind of pressing points, and we're going to defer questions into the the, the panel discussion afterwards. Uh, so the first presentation is uh, Brian Barrage, uh, who is the as you all know, uh, director of the Division of Translational Toxicology and associate director of the National to Toxicology Program. Brian. Great. Thanks, David. And uh, good morning, everybody. I appreciate the opportunity to, to uh, talk to you a little bit this morning about uh, DTT's role in the area of PSAP, PFAS research, and in particular, kind of where we're at mentally right this minute and understanding where to put our, our strategic resources. So just by way of outline, uh, I'll talk a little bit about um, our organizational mission and, and ultimately how that um, aligns to uh, the interest with, with PFAS, a little bit of history of some of the things that we've done in the past, uh, where it fits into our overall strategy as it is, um, as it is designed today. Reflecting on, um, there's lots of players in this, in this field and there's a growing number of efforts and, and ultimately being able to put that, uh, whatever we do in that context is something I'll talk about just briefly. I'll build on a little bit about uh, our um, take on the NASM consensus report that Chris introduced to you, and then ultimately the things that we're thinking about as we think about what our PFAS 2.0, I like the way Chris put that, and I also appreciate Chris's uh, presentation because it was a great introduction to, I think, all of the subsequent presentations that you'll hear. So just briefly, um, we're a public health research organization, and um, um, as by virtue of that, we are uh, an applied research program um, by, uh, by the name that we've recently taken on. Uh, our intent is to conduct research that can be uh, in a very timely way be applied to real decision making that affects um, the public. You know, we also see ourselves as an organization that has an opportunity to transform the way that we do toxicology. Uh, the PFAS issue is one where traditional approaches to toxicology just are not going to work. This is a place where we need to invent new approaches. And we think that that's uh, one of our roles. We're a collaborative organization. Um, we have a significant role in communicating the outcomes of the research that we do for a wide spectrum of st stakeholders. And to the point that was made yesterday, we also feel like that we have an important part to play in educating uh, and training the next generation of scientists who will likely be working as much more multidisciplinary, collaborative, team-based kinds of, uh, of research. And so we think that's an important part of our mission. 
Rick introduced you to the uh, the rationale for the name change uh, that we've recently adopted. Um, as you all, I think, recognize, particularly now, uh, we are one of three agencies that are contributors to the Interagency National Toxicology Program. Um, adopting a, a novel name gave us two opportunities. One was to, um, uh, um, to eliminate any confusion about what the NTP actually was, that it wasn't just us, that, that in fact it involved other agencies. And two, to put real focus on the translational part of what we do. In toxicology, as you all know, we use a lot of, uh, of non-human kinds of approaches to, to uh, characterize hazards. But at the end of the day, what we're interested in is how those hazards um, um, reflect uh, hazards and risks to real people. So we're less interested in hazards to mice and rats and cells in the dish and very much interested in, in how those hazards are, um, are risk for people. And that has an impact on the way that we approach uh, the hazard characterizations that we do. And so we're, we're spending a lot more time thinking about that. As I mentioned, we have a history in doing uh, PFAS related research. And this is a couple of examples of where we've used traditional animal-based uh, GLP uh, regulatory guideline studies um, to, to provide, I think, some interesting and useful foundational information around PFAS. Uh, recently, we did a series of 28-day rat studies where we looked at a, a cross-section of PFAS of varying chemical structure. Um, as was mentioned by Chris, the, the, uh, the legacy chem chemicals PFAS and PFAS are, are uh, generally considered long-chain PFAS. Many of the substitutes that have been developed in the more recent past are shorter change, and the assumption was that those shorter change would, would um, mitigate some of the bioaccumulation and the health effects, and then some of the studies that we did suggested uh, probably otherwise, because we saw the same uh, target organs, although there were some differences in potency, but they were not vastly different in the health effects that we saw in the studies that we did. In addition to that, um, there have been some two-year studies done with um, those legacy PFAS, and in particular PFOA, but there had not been a study done to understand whether there was a, um, a difference in the, in the hazards associated with in utero exposure. So we did a two-year carcinogenicity study by including uh, in, in utero exposures. And, and um, if there is a silver lining here, the silver lining was that there wasn't a big difference between the in utero exposure versus a, a post uh, natal exposure, in the, at least in the context of, of PFOA. So again, we've used traditional animal studies to try to build our foundational understanding of PFAS and the health effects associated with them. We've also used some of the unique um, capabilities that we have, in particular, our uh, systematic review capabilities to integrate existing data um, to make some judgments about potential hazards. And I think the best example of that is the systematic review that was done looking at immune hazards. And as Chris has already related to you, that in fact, there's pretty good evidence to suggest that uh, PFAS have an effect on antibody responses. And that becomes particularly important in the context of the world that we're living in today, where infectious diseases seem to be um, rearing their ugly heads and, and challenging us. And so our, um, dependence on vaccine responses is going to become more and more important. So if we have environmental exposures that are potentially undermining that, then that's, that's an important thing for us to know. In addition to the more traditional uh, approaches, we're also involved in using some of our other capabilities and, and, doing, and doing that collaboratively. collaboratively. For example, we're working with the EPA to look at a, a, a cross-section of, of chemically um, structurally variable PFAS to develop a foundational base of uh, bioactivity um, data using our high throughput kinds of capabilities with the idea that if we had a, a, a foundational understanding of the bioactivity of a spectrum of PFAS, then we could start to make some assumptions about um, other PFAS without actually having to do those experiments. In addition to that, we've used some of our expertise in internal research um, um, and particularly in the context of reproductive endocrinology in, in Sue Fenton's lab and work that Bevan Blake did to do uh, some mouse studies to specifically look at Gen X and its effects on uh, both maternal and neonatal health and, and effects on, on the placenta. In addition to that, uh, Linda has, has been active in the, in the area of um, toxicokinetics, been looking at um, blood-brain barrier and, and use some of the systems that uh, Ron has developed in the lab to look at PFAS effects on uh, blood-brain barrier, and in particular, um, um, 
MDR receptor uh, activities. And in fact, there are effects there. So, so then that starts to compound the problem because it's not just the direct PFAS effect, but ultimately how it might potentiate other environmental or even drug-induced uh, exposures. So a, a lot of a fair portfolio or spectrum of research has been done here in uh, DTT. If you look at uh, PFAS as a, as, a, as a public health issue, and you put that in the context of um, our current strategic portfolio, and this is a slide that I've shared with you in the past, where we've taken our portfolio of research and we've tried to create some strategic structure and, and areas of focus, there are not many areas that, uh, that we're pursuing and, and are interested in where PFAS is not potentially within scope. So I'm saying that to say that, that PFAS are clearly uh, an issue in scope for um, the research that we do here in the DTT, up to and including, as you note there at the bottom, our efforts to develop novel tools and approaches. Because as I said previously, this is a complex enough problem, a broad enough problem that our traditional approaches just aren't going to um, be sufficient. In addition to that, we have, and I've also shared this with you all previously, we've also looked critically at not just what we do, but how we do it. And, and we, as an organization, have a, a broad por portfolio of tools that we have represented in what we call our translational toxicology pipeline. And, and as we take on fundamental, important public health issues, we try to uh, intentionally work this pipeline for a variety of reasons. One, it allows us to take a more evidence-based and focused approach as we work through this pipeline, instead of just defaulting to an animal study and, and largely looking for uh, observations across a wide spectrum of, of organ systems. We actually try to develop a better understanding of bioactivities to allow us to be a little bit more targeted and a little bit more bespoke in how we design those studies. The other part of that is, is that we have an aspiration to ultimately progressively become a more predictive science. And so instead of having to depend on our ability to model apical outcomes, actually be able to generate fundamental mechanistic and, and, and bioactivity kind of data. And from that, infer what those apical outcomes are going to be. And I think that's gonna be an important part of our ability to keep pace with the number of environmental exposures that, that are being in, introduced into, um, in, into our communities. And so our sense of it is, is that if we intentionally work this pipeline, we will iteratively and progressively teach ourselves how to make those kinds of inferences. And so we put that in the context of our, our pipeline. And this pipeline is also a basis for how we would study issues like PFAS. As Chris has shared with you, there's no shortage of putative health effects that have been associated with uh, PFAS. And so part of the problem is not just the fact that there are lots of PFAS, but there are also lots of potential health effects. And so ultimately, how do you know where to focus your attention so that you can add real value in a, in a timely way that's actionable? The other thing is, that, and as I mentioned, there are lots of uh, stakeholders uh, in, the, in the field today. Uh, a lot of government agencies are developing their individual research or, or strategic plans because they've got some unique connection and, and concerns about PFAS. We are obviously a part of, of that community, but understanding how what we do ultimately complements what's being done by other government agencies, actually en enables some of these agencies to be able to do the kinds of things that they do uh, is something that we're very interested in. David Balshaw yesterday introduced you to the, the JEEP, the Joint Subcommittee on Public Health Innovation and um, of the Environment Innovation and Public Health. Uh, that I co-chair as he represented. One of the teams within that is the uh, PFAS strategy team. And what they're trying to do is ultimately bring these agencies together and ultimately compare notes, be able to represent and raise the visibility of the things that are happening. And then to collectively identify research gaps that, that we can all can contribute to. As you look across those efforts, there are commonalities in the things that we're interested in. Fundamentally, everybody's interested in the human health effects because that's gonna drive the kinds of things that we're gonna to do to, to try to mitigate some of those uh, effects. Clinical management obviously was a major focus for ATSDR with uh, the NASM report. Uh, we all have an interest in, in, um, the, in uh, enabling the development of uh, more uh, safer and sustainable alternatives uh, for the future because as also was represented yesterday, these uh, PFAS chemicals actually serve useful purposes in commerce. 
And so to just take them out of commerce um, will leave a gap in some of the uses that they're, they're intended for. And so how do we develop things that can give us the same benefits without the harms associated with them is an important part of um, how we manage a, a, a safer future. So you've heard these, these, these challenges previously that um, there are a number of things that make this a, um, uh, a challenging space. One is this, just the sheer number of, of PFAS. And as Rick said yesterday, every time you get a number, it's, it's a bigger number, unfortunately. But the reality of it is there are lots of them out there. There are lots of people who are interested in this, both in the community uh, basis, but also government agencies. There are lots of folks who are doing research in this field. There are competing priorities. It would be great if PFAS was the only public health problem we, that we have, but it is not. And so if the effort that we put into PFAS is effort we're not putting into something else. So there are there's competing priorities in our portfolio. So understanding strategically where best to put our effort is very, very important. For us, it's a, it's a matter of being able to match our technical and intellectual capabilities to, uh, again, those real needs. And again, as I've said, they need to be products. Um, it's easy to do, to do things. It's easy to do research. It's easy to publish papers. It's easy to give presentations. It's much harder to identify discrete problems and develop actionable products in timely ways. And that's a critical part of what we're trying to do. So fundamental question to us is, is where do we put our investment, our, our resource chips as it relates to PFAS? And that's a question that we've been entertaining here for the last few years as we've been progressing some of our, our legacy efforts. So when ATSDR came along and said, hey, look, we've got this idea about having a study done uh, by the National Academies, um, are you all interested? And, and uh, although we're not particularly interested, interested is not the right word, although we're not particularly involved in developing clinical guidances, the part of this that ultimately was um, that was going to define those, those uh, that input for clinical guidances, which was where's the evidence, the clinical evidence, the human evidence that tells us where the, the primary health effects are, was something that could be very valuable to us. And so we were very interested in being a part of this and appreciate the invitation. So as Chris shared with you, there were a number of, um, of health effects, um, unfortunately, a large number of health effects that, that have been identified for which the evidence um, varies, at least in the level of support for these different things. And these, uh, these different bins of, of evidence-based uh, potential health effects is an opportunity for us. And so the kinds of things that we're thinking about now is that we've got a, a, a discrete number of, uh, of health effects um, that for which there is sufficient evidence. So what value do we add there? Does, is it add value for us to have a better mechanistic understanding about how those effects are? Does that allow us to extrapolate that evidence to a broader community of, uh, of uh, potential stakeholders? Is it, would it be important or valuable for us to develop more evidence for those things where it's the evidence is, is less, um, uh, less um, supportive? to ultimately move them up the list if in fact there's, there's good evidence to suggest that, that in fact those potential health effects are real. And then there's an even longer list of things that are, um, that are putative, that are re obvious research gaps, are those things that are things that we should be worried about or not. So there's the, the outcomes of this NASIM report provides us lots of opportunity to reflect on where the evidence is and understand where our particular capabilities might be able to add value in the context of these varying levels of, of evidence. So these are the things that we're considering. We know we're, we're exposed to, we're all exposed to PFAS and that there are health effects um, that have been associated with them. There's already a lot of existing PFAS data. Is there enough existing data to make decisions? Is it more a matter of taking that data, the existing data and integrating it and making, making decisions from it? Should we do anything? As I mentioned to you, um, if we do this, then we're not doing something else. Is there something else that's not being covered by some, uh, some other organization that we should focus our attention on? Seems unlikely that we shouldn't be doing something in this space, but understanding what we should do is, is critically important. So if we decide that there is, are, are things that we should do, can we identify discrete gaps, definable problems, develop and define actionable products and ultimately deliver them in a, in a timely way? That's critical for us being an impactful organization. So in summary, um, the, the DTT has been and, and continues to be active in the area of PFAS research. Um, I think our intellectual and technical resources 
um, capabilities put us in a in a place where we can add add real value. Um, it's easy enough for us to do research, but but identifying an impactful place in the context of the complexity that is is developing within the PFAS world is not without its its challenges. Our resources aren't limitless, just like everybody else. If we do this, we're not doing something else. So what's less important than us working on on PFAS? And then ultimately, where do we put our efforts so, such that that uh, the uh, the impact is something that um, um, is could be delivered in in a timely way? As Chris has shared with you, and in fact, one I think one of the meaningful things um, a part of being a part of that that uh, National Academy study was our ability to participate in the town halls that were set up as a, as part of that that effort. You know, incredibly informative. There are folks who have concerns today. There are people who are being affected today. Probably not a great idea for us to look at a 10 year plan. Um, we should be looking at a nearer term plan to ultimately add value. With that, I'll thank you. And as I said, we're going to defer questions for these unless there's something that's a, a, a critical uh, question of clarification. Uh, but our preference is going to be to, to, to hold questions, come back into the panel discussion with those. Uh, so I'd like to move on to our, our second presentation in, of this hour, which is uh, focusing on uh, kind of starting with the epidemiological findings and the data that supported the NASM study, but then leading into some future directions from that. Uh, and we've asked Jane Hoppen from NC State University to, to give this presentation. Uh, so Jane. Thanks, David. Um, and thanks, everybody. Um, so. Um, I'm going to focus on more about the kind of complexities of exposure here in North Carolina and maybe have a teaser of our health effect findings. And a lot of the questions and comments that have been raised um, are very apparent as I talk about what's happening in the Gen X study. So um, uh, let's see. Do I have control? No. Okay, I do. So I'm going to talk about the Gen X exposure study, and I'm also super happy that everybody's already told people what PFAS are. Um, so the Gen X exposure study started in, in response to community concerns, and we were able to leverage our P30 center to within a, a month of when the contamination and community concern was discovered, we were able to write a grant and submit it to NIHS, and then three months later, we were funded, and two weeks later, we collected 300 blood samples. So we've been working really hard on this topic since then. Um, and the study has been designed to answer kind of three fundamental questions. What is Gen X? Is it in me? And does it have health effects? And when we got started, we had partners both at ECU and NC State, they're part of our um, P30 center. Um, but we also partnered with an NGO, Cape Fear River Watch, and kind of fundamentally to get started, we partnered with the New Hanover County Health Department. So we added legitimacy early on in this process. So um, for those of you who don't live here, um, the Cape Fear River Basin is the largest river basin in North Carolina. Uh, it provides drinking water for over a million people. Um, and today I'm gonna focus on the exposure in Wilmington and some of the, um, the exposure to people in Wilmington and this exposure source up river, which is um, the Keymore's Fayetteville Works facility. So they have been discharging to the river, chemical PFAS to the river uh, for about 40 years, since 1980. Ugh. I have the worst mouth, sorry. Okay, so um, so that's the river. And um, so my colleague Detlef Kanapi and researchers at EPA published this paper in December of 2016. And it showed that there were PFAS in the Finnish drinking water of Wilmington that were almost identical to the source water in Wilmington, which suggested that, um, conventional, even though it's very high level water treatment was ineffective at removing PFAS from drinking water. And most importantly, you, whoa, sorry, um, where is my, wait, let me just go back here. Sorry, I apologize. Um, 
I can't point with my mouse. So I'm just gonna, you're gonna have to figure it out. So oh, where am I? Sorry. Most importantly, there's a big red bar in the lower box. That was the kind of concentration of this brand new chemical called Gen X. And you can see the high, the upper level chemical, there was lots of other legacy PFAS at different points in the river. So people were concerned about that. And so, but it took six months or so for the, the news media to pick it up. And then it, it happened super fast. This is the second week um, article by Adam Wagner. And then there were public meetings every, every Wednesday, Water Wednesday, where they convened large groups of people uh, to talk about what to do. And so one of the things that was done was that they worked with the Department of Environmental Quality um, to have the Kimor stop facility stop discharging uh, Gen X to the drinking water. And so you can see quickly that the levels of Gen X dropped from about 700 parts per trillion in the drinking water to uh, less than 100 in a couple of weeks. And so there's some been some variation. Um, early in July, North Carolina set a health goal for Gen X of 140. EPA just set a health goal of 10 um, in the past few months. So, so we're responding to community concerns and they want to know, am I exposed? Is the chemical in my body? What are the health effects? And our challenges were, well, what chemicals do we look for? There's a big red bar, but there's all these other chemicals. Um, most of these chemicals, because they're byproducts of chemical production, don't have analytic standards. Um, we, Gen X was the only chemical that had a name that, and was used as an active ingredient. So we had no information to guess on the half-life. These newer chemicals are believed to have shorter half-lives. Um, but we didn't know what to expect. There's little or no toxicology data to suggest what health outcomes to look at. And there's nobody to compare these two. So, um, but being the brave scientists that we are, we, for, we um, for, forwarded on. So Gen X is, is a chemical that's used to make Teflon and it replaced PFOA or C8 in the uh, chemical manufacturing business in about 2008, 2009. So when C8 was rolled out, was um, taken off the market, Gen X was a replacement. And you can see the big blue box, big, big blue circle is the ether oxygen. So this is supposed to make these chemicals less environmentally persistent. Uh, it has six carbons also should make it less environmentally persistent, but all those oxygen groups also make it happy to stay in water for as long as possible. So the, as I mentioned, the chemical company was making these fluoro intermediates. So um, since about 1980. And so you can see that they're very relatively short chain building blocks for um, fluorochemicals. So this is what they were making, but they were also making these fluoroethers. And these were what was being discharged to the river. And so you see in the top left-hand corner, Gen X. And so um, it's got six carbons next to it. It's a low molecular weight chemical, PFMOA, that has three carbons and a ether oxygen group. And then more, all the other chemicals with the exception of NBHAS have multiple ether oxygen so that they become they start out as low molecular weight uh, fluoroethers, but they become these high molecular weight uh, chemicals that are the ones that are discharged to the river. And so, so there's two, two communities in North Carolina who, who have been impacted by Gen X. The first is in Wilmington and really the whole lower Cape Fear Basin because um, about 250,000 people drink water from the lower Cape Fear. So this includes Brunswick and New Hanover County, but some of Pender and Bladen. Um, and we anticipate that people were drinking water for 40 years that had potentially 700 parts per trillion every day. We don't know for sure. Um, and then there's also the Fayetteville community, the people who live around the plant and um, 
We didn't start here because there was so little known at that point in time. We now are also following this community, but I'm gonna focus now on our work in Wilmington. So what did we do? So we had two community blood draws. We had uh, community partners, students from ECU and NC State um, involved. And we enrolled Wilmington residents who were served by the Cape Fear Public Utility Authority. Um, and so that primarily those people were served by uh, surface water, about 10% of their area is served by groundwater and they don't mix it. So we can actually see differences in those people. But we focused on um, everybody, but we knew where their water source was. Um, we enrolled people six and older. We had up to four people per household. Ultimately, we enrolled 344 people. We enrolled 310 people um, in November 2017, so two weeks after we got funded. Um, it's very hard to build a community trust in two weeks. So we did not do very well recruiting African-Americans. And so one of our uh, science advisory panel members who was the NAACP health rep said, you can work with us. And so we partnered with them in May of 2018 to recruit more black people to the study, but also made the effort to resample a subset. So not only are we working to make our study more inclusive, but we have a study design that helps us answer this question about how long do these chemicals last in our body? So we collected water and drinking water, water we had blood and drinking water from people's homes. And um, we analyzed all of these for the same suite of PFAS, including Gen X and other PFAS. We've um, conducted clinical analyses of lipids, hormone, thyroid hormones, and comprehensive metabolic panel. We measured BMI and then we report everything back. And, and we are really committed to reporting everything back. We started our first community science advisory panel. We heard, we wanna know what you know, when you know it, even when you don't know what it means. Terrifying to a scientist. We wanna know where we are, what, what it means. So we have worked hard um, to, to share inf information with people. Um, at, and in a couple of different ways. We mail letters to individuals. We have community members. We put all our materials on our website. We have community science advisory panels. So we work really hard to do that. And um, it's, it's important, but it's not a trivial amount of work. <laughs> um, so who participated in our study? So we had 344 people, 289 adults, and 55 children. Children range in age from six to 17. And you can see that we did better. We, we recruited 10% um, black, 9% Hispanic, and 5% people of other races. So we do have diversity there. Um, we also recruited people in English and in Spanish. So um, that was an important partnership. Um, and we have developed materials in both languages as a result. Um, and so, it's also important to see if we were interested in kind of high versus low, do we get any variability based on how long you've lived there? And so we do, everybody's a volunteer, but we do have um, a, a range of, of duration of time living in the area. And so this work and all of the results I'm presenting are from Nadine Kotlar's paper that was published in 2020. Um, so this is for the blood. For water, we had fewer chemical standards. So, so we had chemical standards for 23 PFAS when we did this in 2017-18. And you'll notice on the newly identified PFAS list that only one of those is in black because that's the only chemical uh, standard that we could get um, from a, a supplier. And the rest, all the green chemicals we had to get from the chemical company itself, which not only does it um, make it more challenging, you know, like we, we are pretty confident in those standards, but it also means there's not a lot of chemical out there to do the toxicity testing on these chemicals. So what do we find? Found that I need a new mouse. Um, so we found seven PFAS in the blood of almost everyone. So we found 
three brand new PFAS, Napium Byproduct 2, PFO4DA, and PFO5DOA. Um, we did not detect Gen X in anyone. And this was a question that the health director of New Hanover County asked me early on. What happens if we don't find Gen X? So um, is that good? Is that bad? We're still having those conversations because we know people drank that water for 40 years. We also measured legacy PFAS, PFOA, PFOS, PFNA, and PFHXS in everybody. Um, but we also identified three other brand new chemicals in, in, not in everybody, but in some people, PFO3OA and VHAS and HydroEve, which we identified but lacked an analytic standard at this time. We're actually rerunning some of those at this time. So what do these chemicals look like? So these were on the slide of what people were just, what was being discharged to the river. So we have Napheon byproduct 2, which is a sulfonic acid, and then two carboxylic acids, PFO4DA and PFO5DA. And you can see that these are not small chemicals. So we have the fluoroethers are supposed to be short, they're not short chained. These are the chemicals that are, we're measuring in people at this time. All right, now nothing's working. <laughs> All right, so, okay, so how much was found? So um, the concentrations that we measured in people, particularly Napheon byproduct 2 and PFO4DA, were of a range that was similar to the values of PFOA. So these concentrations, we see some variability. We would expect that. We have variability in our population, how long they exposed, and some people drank surface water. We're working to understand PFO5 DOA at this time. So one of the things we learned from uh, collecting 44 samples twice, 44 people twice, is that the levels of, of these chemicals dropped pretty dramatically in a six month period. So six months apart, Napheon byproduct 2 levels don't drop entirely by half, but close. PFO4DA drops um, pretty dramatically in that window. And PFO5DOA has about the same half-life as Napheon byproduct 2. So um, thanks to um, Chris, who said people like to compare to the NHANES, because that is what we did. We compared not only the first round of NHANES, which we would anticipate to be the highest levels in the United States, to the, the NHANES that was available at the time that we were doing this work, 2015, 2016. And then uh, we also compare them to the more recent National Academy values. So this we did not expect to see. So the first box being the US population in 1999, uh, the second being the New York population in 2015, and then the third being Wilmington in 2017. And so just, just eyeball statistics, Wilmington looks like the U.S. population in 2019. And in 2015, comparing that, the 95th percentile of PFOA exceeded the median value. And so we have, we have more kids in our sample, but um, we were not expecting that this population was highly exposed to the legacy, but uh, to Daryl's comment earlier is that there's a lot of upstream sources and landfilling of these chemicals. So not only was it PFOA, but also PFHXS, PFNA, PFDA, and PFOS. So, so there, people are highly exposed. And then when we com like compare these to what we, um, what the National Academy panel suggested, over half of our adults exceed 20 nanograms per mil. So half of them are at the highest risk of adverse effects. Um, most of our children are between the two and 20 nanograms per mil, about 90%. Uh, and about half the adults in that range, no person had PFAS below two, which is not, we. so only about 8% of NHANES we would expect. So we have a highly exposed population just for the legacy. Um, I'm afraid to touch my mouth. Um, so how much of the fluoroethers add to this mix? So we had quantified 10 fluoroethers and 10 legacy PFAS. Um, 
And we had another fluoroether hydro Eve that we couldn't quantify. So, and this is always the challenge moving forward is that a new fluoroether, there's not a chemical standard. Um, you need the MS2 to resolve it molecular weight. So, so we know that we're missing the total burden with our 20 that we're gonna look at. So we know that some of them may miss something and um, other methods like total organofluorine in the future may help answer that. So what do we find? Okay, so here's the overall burden of uh, total PFAS in Wilmington adults and children. And not surprisingly, adults are higher than kids. Um, okay, so, but when we look at the contribution of the fluoroethers that we could quantify, it's about 25% of the total contribution. So we bump, almost all the kids are now bumped into like up to almost, this is the median. So more people would be in 20 if we were summing all the fluoroethers, but as a panel, there was no data, health data on the fluoroethers to make any inference. So, so we have high, high exposure and, um, and also that that exposure is changing because it has a shorter half-life than the legacy PFAS. So what are we missing when we use blood to assess exposure? And so this is work that combines our work with um, work out of Detlef Kanapi's group where they went back and reanalyzed water samples that were collected in 2015. And so the bars are the concentration of the individual chemicals uh, in, in water, nanograms per ml. And first and most importantly, notice it's on the log scale. So we have PFHXS, which is about 12 nanograms per liter. And then we have PFMOAA that's over 100,000 nanograms per liter. And so then what I've highlighted in red were the chemicals that we could find in blood. So that there's a lot of chemicals here that are in relatively high concentrations in drinking water that we can't detect. And PFMOAA is in light, a lighter color because we have a standard for it. Um, but it, it's very difficult to analyze for in, um, in a method that's optimized for the higher molecular weight. So, um, so, so we might be able to detect that in blood, but it, we have to figure out analytic methods need to change. But we know that people are exposed to a lot of Gen X, a lot of PFMP, PMPA, and we, we can measure PFO3OAs six months after the exposure happened, but not much later. So, so that we're missing these historic exposures by re relying on blood samples collected in 2022. So, and this is from our kind of community meeting. So if Gen X isn't in your blood, what does it mean? Well, it means that Gen X has a very short half-life. And uh, recently some work by EFSA and workers in the Netherlands showed that Gen X has a half-life about three days in our body. So we really can only measure a few days in the past. But that doesn't mean there's no risk from past exposures. And I like to use alcohol as an example. Like we know that drinking alcohol for a long time has health effects, but we can't measure all of that at the same time. So if we want to understand the long-term health effects, we need to be able to estimate past exposure using information on the water levels, water consumption, probably discharge information from the plant for the 40 years that these chemicals were discharged. Mm, come on. So again, to like thinking about evaluating PFAS exposure, some PFAS are biologically persistent. So biomarkers are probably good integrated measures on long-term exposure. Half-lives of these chemicals range from two to seven years, but the fluoroethers have short half-lives, um, about three days for Gen X, about a year for Nafium Byproduct 2, PFHXA, which is a six chain, has a shorter half-life than Nafium Byproduct 2, but it's more commonly used so we can detect that in people. Um, so for fluoroethers, biomarkers may be poor measures of long-term exposure and we need to reconstruct exposure history. And most importantly, 
all exposures happen together, together. It's very difficult to disentangle. But these different half-lives also mean that you almost need to collect all your samples at the same point in time because as levels will be changing and you don't want to combine data across, you know, and you might see differences that are just based on when they were sampled. All right, come on, little thing. Okay, so to wrap it up, we we looked for Gen X, but we found new PFAS in the blood of all Wilmington residents. Um, the, the levels of the elevated levels of this of PFAS and particularly PFOA, actually the Scott Bartel uh, drinking water calculator to predict blood level works to pre predict that. Um, one of the things is we don't know about the past. What were the potential peak exposures? Um, about 25% of the PFAS in blood was related to the new chemicals and we can't measure or quantify all the new chemicals. This is an underestimate. So where do we go? So wrapping it up is like in 2020, we got funded as part of the NC State um, Superfund Center, the Center for Environmental and Health Effects PFAS. And so we're the, the Gen X study is growing from an exposure study to a health study. And so um, we recruited over a thousand participants in 2020 and 2021. And we include not only the lower Cape Fear, so we've expanded to Brunswick County from, um, so we have Wilmington and Brunswick County, Fayetteville area, the people who live around the plant, as well as Pittsburgh that's up river of, of the Camores facility, but also has the high legacy PFAS. So we're collecting blood twice, we're measuring PFAS next month, we're reporting those results back. We're measuring thyroid hormones, and we're also um, looking at response to uh, COVID and COVID vaccines. Right. All right, and so there's a lot of people involved, and these are just some of them. Um, but uh, you know, those of you who do community work, you know, you can't. There's too many people always to list, and we're funded by not only NIHS but also the NC Policy Collaboratory. Um, and with that, I'll end. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Jane. That was was fantastic uh, tour de force presentation uh, in 20 minutes. Um, so we, we also asked another member of the uh, NASM committee to come uh, and, and share some wisdom. And so we're, I'm, I'm pleased to welcome back to council, uh, former member uh, Kevin Elliott from Michigan State, who's going to uh, talk through some of the ethical and social uh, implications of, of PFAS exposure uh, from the report and then moving forward. So Kevin. All right, fantastic. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. All right, fantastic. Well, thank you so much. Um, what I'd like to do in uh, this presentation, let me make sure things are moving forward. Great. Is um, so first, I, I'd like to build um, a, a lot of these ethical and social issues from the report. So one of the things we did in the report is to uh, develop principles for decision making under uncertainty. And so I'd like to spend the first part of my presentation talking about that. Um, then I'd like to just discuss a little bit about the importance of engaging with affected communities, um, our work with that in the report and thinking about that in future activities. And then um, spend a little bit of time at the end thinking about some other issues to consider. So here I'm broadening a little bit beyond the report, um, thinking about some of the issues we want to be thinking about related to defining and categorizing PFAS, um, some of the obstacles uh, that we face when studying PFAS, and some of the issues we want to be thinking about in terms of providing education for clinicians about occupational and environmental health. So um, that's where I'm headed. Let me start with uh, principles for decision making under uncertainty. And so um, in the statement of task that the committee received, um, you can see these three key bullet points. And uh, the first was that the committee was asked to develop principles for biological testing and clinical evaluation given substantial scientific uncertainty about the health effects or the value of such measures. Um, and so, um, you know, this raises a challenge that I think you all can appreciate that, you know, often when we're dealing with uncertainty, you know, some folks would argue we may want to um, avoid acting as soon as we seem to have science about some risks uh, for fear that maybe the association we seem to be seeing isn't a true one. And so we could end up acting in inappropriate or costly ways. Um, on the other hand, others would argue that you know, if we wait for more certain evidence, meaningful action will be delayed. And so the committee emphasized 
that you know we face dangers in both directions. When evidence is incomplete, there can be dangers both with taking action and with failing to act. And often there can be a sort of a tendency um, to prefer to fail to act, um, but we really need to keep in mind those dangers. And that was something the committee was aware of. So uh, after looking at a variety of frameworks for decision-making under uncertainty, the committee ended up coming up with these five principles um, uh, for use in the report. And the first is proportionality, the idea that decisions should balance plausible harms and benefits proportionally. And I just emphasize that um, the committee in discussing this uh, principle said that, you know, the harms and benefits should be considered together and weighed based on a qualitative assessment of their potential likelihoods and magnitudes, knowing that when you're dealing with substantial uncertainty, it may not be possible to get really precise quantitative estimates. Um, and so one should do the best one can. Then a second principle, uh, the report emphasizes the importance of justice. And you know, I appreciated Daryl you know, bringing some of this up already, um, that decisions should be informed by an emphasis on promoting justice, balancing benefits and harms fairly across the population of at-risk individuals, considering health equity, human rights, and, and other issues. Um, then the third principle was autonomy that decisions should be based on informed decision-making and respect the values of individuals, that that's really important. When you're facing uncertainty, different folks may have different values, um, different tolerances for making different kinds of decisions, and it's important to respect different people's values. And then fourth, feasibility. One needs to take into account resource availability, but the report emphasizes that you know, in some cases, you may identify that there isn't resource availability for certain things, and once you recognize this, this, this is a sign that you need to call for more resources. So this doesn't necessarily mean, well, certain actions aren't feasible at this time, so we just give up forever. <laughs> and then a fifth point is adaptability. It's really important when responding to uncertainty to be uh, able to adapt to new information and not get locked into particular approaches. So those are our big picture principles. And two that we especially emphasized were autonomy and justice. So I just wanna say a little bit more about those two. Um, the report says in the clinical setting, um, these principles tend to converge under the principle of autonomy. Um, so shared informed decision-making between clinicians and patients is sort of the way to incorporate these principles into clinical encounters. And so this really informed one of the key recommendations in the report, 5.2, which said that clinicians should offer PFAS testing to patients likely to have a history of elevated exposure. And then in offering that, clinicians should describe potential benefits and harms of testing, potential clinical content consequences, social implications, and limitations of testing so the patient and clinician can make a shared informed decision. And so this is kind of this expression of autonomy, the thought that different people based on their values, some may decide it makes sense to get tested, others may not, but having the clinicians and patients work together to make that decision is really important. Um, and um, you know, just an example of the kinds of things that you know the report suggested that clinicians could discuss with patients to help them make that decision. Um, this list of potential harms and potential benefits, so they can decide based on their values how to weigh those considerations. Then, in terms of justice, um, you're, the the report emphasizes that environmental risks are not distributed uniformly across populations. There are a variety of factors that place some people at disproportionately high risk for diseases with environmental causes because of exposures, and. The report notes, um, it was great to hear um, Chris's response to Daryl this morning. It's great to hear that more work is being done on environmental justice in the PFAS context. And the report um, it notes that um, there's been limited research to date, but from what we know previously, place-based factors that may put individuals at greater risk of exposure, um, as well as insufficient access to environmental screening and information in healthcare do have disproportionate impacts on uh, you know, some communities. It's really important for us to, to think about as we move forward. Um, another point that the report makes involving justice to think about has to do with blood testing. Um, you know, the report notes that testing for PFAS is expensive. It, it it gives us an opportunity to identify people who may need to reduce exposure. Um, but it's important to recognize 
that you know, race, age, and other characteristics have already disadvantaged many patients with respect to accessing um, services like PFAS testing. And then this disadvantage is compounded because you know, ideally you want counseling um, on steps to mitigate exposure after testing, and there may be a lack of access to that as well. And so I would just note, thinking from a justice perspective, the report says that if we just encourage testing among people with relatively stable access to care, that can actually aggravate disparities in exposure to PFAS unless we have something like a funded national PFAS testing program with a counseling component. So the report, you know, the committee wasn't tasked with making recommendations on these sorts of points, but noted these um, considerations related to justice. Um, so that gives you a sense of what the committee had to say about principles for decision making under uncertainty. Um, let me say a little bit about community engagement in the report. Um, a critical component, as the report notes, um, to our approach was community engagement, drawing from the experiential learning that community uh, had. And so we had a panel of community li liaisons, there were three town halls. You can look um, in an appendix to the report to get information about those town halls. Um, there were community speakers at the meetings, sign up for public testimony, encouragement of written testimony. And this was really valuable um, in order to get a sense of the values and, uh, and information that community members had. You can. This is sort of an overview um, from that appendix in the report. And I would just draw your attention to these four bullet points that highlight some of the key themes that were presented. Um, so first was an immediate need for accessible PFAS blood testing. That was an important theme um, coming out of these town halls. Second was calling for continued assessment of PFAS health effects. Third, the need for equitable action that supports the most vulnerable and disproportionately affected. And fourth, a continuing need for comprehensive exposure assessments. So these were some of the, the messages that we uh, got from those town halls. And another message that I'm going to come back to at the end of my presentation is the message that from a clinical perspective, providers needed a better working knowledge of environmental health and chemical exposures. So you know, the committee heard from speakers who described their frustration trying to obtain medical care from practitioners who weren't familiar with PFAS, didn't really understand these environmental health contexts. And just a, kind of a striking quotation to give you a sense for the kinds of messages. Um, at one of the town halls, one of the speakers said they would go to doctors, talk about some of the ex chemical exposures they had, and they felt like the doctors were, were really dismissive, that they, they weren't understanding environmental components of disease and um, uh, you know, making uh, those who came to them with these worries you know, feel um, embarrassed and, and small. And then I would just note, you know, thinking about moving forward um, with uh, ongoing community engagement uh, and, and research related to PFAS, just a couple examples from the report to think about. You know, the NIEHS, you know, has I think been at the forefront of trying to you know build community engagement into its research, and so you know a great example of this, um, the NIEHS has funded PFAS Reach, which is a project. It's a collaboration between the Silent Spring Institute and a couple universities um, with collaboration with other community organizations. And um, you know, one of the things this project is doing is creating an online resource center with fact sheets and maps and um, you know, information about how people can reduce their exposures. So that's something that the committee uh, drew on. And I think it would be great to see the NIHS continue to be at the forefront of creative efforts um, like this. And you know, another example of engagement that um, you know, the committee heard about was once again from the Silent Spring Institute their digital exposure report back interface and um, the benefits for people of receiving individual biomonitoring results um, and uh, ways for them to, um, you know, the, the benefits for this in terms of engagement, uh, people being able to take actions to reduce their exposures and so on. So I think it would be great to be thinking about ongoing ways to move forward with this. 
So let me then um, conclude in the last section of my talk with some other issues for us to be thinking about from an ethical and social perspective. And one is, you know, I'm my training is in the philosophy of science. And um, so we would say that some of the issues involving defining and categorizing PFAS um, involve coupled ethical and epistemic issues. So when you're trying to decide, you know, how to, to group PFAS into categories for uh, studying them, screening them, you know, research policy, making regulations, um, you know, there are definitely sort of, you know, scientific aspects to that. But there are also ethical aspects to thinking about, you know, if you group them more broadly, you know, you may err in one direction, you know, potentially, you know, regulating more than you would have to. If you group them too narrowly, you may err in the opposite direction. And so one needs to think about, you know, what, how you would like to approach some of those issues. Um, so just an example of a couple articles along these lines, um, you know, there have been pieces suggesting different ways that we could be grouping PFAS together for different kinds of decision making. And so, um, you know, this, I think, is um, something that we need to be thinking about moving forward, um, different ways of, of grouping these and thinking about sort of the evidence and the ethical and social aspects of how we decide to group them. And, you know, then another sort of categorization issue is, you know, for some regulatory purposes, it's been proposed that, you know, perhaps if PFAS don't fall in the category of, of essential use, um, maybe one ought to really minimize um, the use of them. But then we have to decide what counts as essential use. And so once again, we get into some of the ethical and social issues of, of how we define a category like that. Another issue I think we should be thinking about um, involves obstacles um, to research. And you heard some of this in our previous presentations. Jane was bringing this up. And I would just draw your attention to this policy forum piece that appeared in Science um, this last January, where a couple of legal scholars um, highlighted some of uh, some legal issues that we need to be thinking about. And one was exactly what Jane was mentioning, the insufficient availability of chemical standards. Another thing they mentioned was limited public access to information because of confidential business information and the limits that places on some of our federal agencies. And um, then excessive fragmentation of information within and among government agencies. And I think it's really interesting that one of the case studies that this uh, piece used related to PFAS, um, where uh, researchers from the US EPA and the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection identified this particular group of uh, PFAS, and um, uh, they were largely unknown to the members of the research team. They tried to investigate further, and even though they were part of these government agencies, uh, they had trouble getting the kind of information that they wanted to, to really be able to investigate these. So I think that's something that we need to be thinking about. Um, and another obstacle that came up um, in the report is um, the issue of exposure surveillance system for chemicals. So the committee notes in the report that the recommendations would be most effective if they were part of a larger national effort toward PFAS-focused biomonitoring, exposure surveillance, and education. Um, and this ties to one of the recommendations in the report that you know we could make some progress if laboratories that are conducting PFAS testing reported the results to state public health authorities um, and then perhaps um, that information could be linked with the CDC's environmental public health tra tracking network. So some things to be thinking about in that regard. And then my last point um, comes back to what we heard from some of those community members involving um, medical education. So the report noted that from a clinical perspective, providers need a better working knowledge of environmental health and chemical exposures. And the report refers back to um, an earlier report back in 1991, where the Institute of Medicine said that at all levels of medical education, from undergraduate to continuing education uh, programs, there was limited training in occupational and environmental medicine and said that this really needs to be improved. And uh, our report um, refers to this uh, study, finding that there continue to be issues in this regard. And we're seeing in the case of PFAS how community members are frustrated going to uh, their clinicians and um, not having responsiveness to some of these environmental health issues. 
So uh, that brings me to the end. You know, I've tried to kind of give you a sense of our, our thoughts about the ethical issues involved in decision making under uncertainty, some of the key principles that we talked about. You know, I think we should keep thinking about issues of community engagement and how to do this really effectively and creatively uh, going forward. And um, I think we can be thinking about sort of these epistemic and ethical issues involved in how we define and categorize uh, these substances, how we can get beyond some of the obstacles that we face um, with these studies, and um, thinking about ways of contributing to better education um, for the medical community. Uh, let me get my video back on. Uh, thank you, Kevin. Um, uh, great presentation. I think that set this up very nicely. Uh, so what we're going to do now, uh, Michelle Bennett is going to moderate a, a council discussion uh, for the next 54 minutes. Um, we do have a hard stop at one o'clock because several of us are going to be jumping over to the, the Expose Home Summit. Um, and, but uh, Michelle, I will let you uh, take it from here. Yeah, thank you very much, David. And thanks to Chris and Brian and Jane and Kevin for those outstanding presentations. Really, really fantastic. Um, I see a couple of hands up already and I think that's fantastic. Um, and in order to sort of set the stage for, for our discussion over the next hour, I also wanted to capture a few of the things that you've heard about over the last couple of hours. Um, especially in the um, given the perspective that you know we'd really like to hear from uh, the council members, the speakers. We'd like to hear your ideas about what is it that is most pressing and most important for us to do to to do based on everything that we've heard. And so I'm just going to read through the questions, and then I'll ask that the slide be taken down, and I'll. Uh, I can put the questions in the chat box so everybody can refer to them, but just so that we can see each other a little bit better. So here's some, some questions to get you thinking a little bit if you're not already thinking a lot. Um, of the challenges that you've heard about today, for example, the need for better exposure surveillance, the lack of chemical standards, fragmentation of information among government agencies, which are the most pressing? issues and what approaches are most promising for addressing them? What scientific investments today will have the most return tomorrow in helping our public stakeholders? And we've talked a lot about community engagement. How can we improve exposure reconstruction, recognizing that we don't know the full extent of PFAS exposures in the United States, let alone it sounds like what all of the PFAS chemicals are, um, their persistence or what cumulative exposure looks like. Um, in what ways can toxicology and computational biology help us bridge the gaps with what's being observed in epidemiologic studies? And what role, if any, does NIEHS or the broader NIH have in better educating clinicians about environmental and occupational health? So I let you think about that a little bit while we go to um, Lynn, who has her hand up. Thank you so much for that. And I'm going to start with your last question, but I have another comment as well. And, and that is, I can't agree more um, with um, the last speaker about the lack of preparation uh, by clinicians to be able to address um, issues like, like PFAS. And, and this is something that um, many of us have spent big chunks of our entire careers on. Um, and it's just true that um, medical education provides very little in the way of knowledge or preparation um, for environmental health uh, practice period or occupational health practice even. And, um, and, and there have been times in history um, when far more focus um, was given by um, the NIEHS, ATSDR, NIOSH, and others on, on attempting um, to provide um, more education. You know, the problem is you can try to load it into medical school curriculum, but most practitioners graduated years ago. And so you kind of have to hit everybody. But I would also say that, you know, I mean, it's an ethical problem that people can't get their individual um, 
situation um, evaluated by an individual physician, but it's also an ethical problem that um, I don't think that we have a standardized, reliable clinical test to use. I think it's, I mean, I'm, ha I'm, a, I'm, I'm having a little bit of problems and I, you know, I've read the, uh, the National County's report, but just wondering if you had a physician on the committee that, you know, you, you can't, um, you can't get reliable information just by going willy-nilly to labs and asking them to do analytics. I mean, these are extremely important results for people. And I have been in way too many situations in my past life when I used to actually be in the practice of public health and environmental health, where you know erroneous and um, in, incorrect lab results were driving individual and community and other decisions, and, um, and which turned out to be, uh, and it's very unethical to do that. It's very unethical to do that. Um, you know. A, a level that somebody reported me when I worked the state, which would have been lethal if the person had that level, you know, would have been lethal, certainly lethal. And people get all kinds of results from crummy labs. So I, I, I do think it's important, but I think there's a whole infrastructure that has to be built up. I mean, we, we need more chemistry. Gary's going to agree with that. We don't have enough capacity um, to do these things, but we, we need to, it to be implemented in a way that there's some validation, um, whether through CLIA or the states that have those processes and the clinicians, you know, know how to, um, or somebody is there to counsel people and, and know how to interpret the results of it. It's, it's, it's a terrible situation in terms of the, um, the lack of, of an infrastructure in clinical medicine to deal with this. I mean, I also want to say, you know, as a former regulator, <laughs> but I, I, I think it's, it's completely immoral and completely, I mean, the fact that these discharges were happening during the time period when they were happening, um, you know, after some companies had voluntarily moved out of, of producing these, and then the proliferation of new and more and more and more PFAS, I don't know how important it is to have a nonstick pan. I'm just going to say that. I, I just, not every use that industry has for a chemical is critical to us. And, you know, I remember the old days of cast iron pans that were perfectly fine. You can make an omelet, whatever you need to make. And so, you know, we have come to believe these things are essential, whereas, you know, we really haven't had them for very many decades and the human race has been able to make it, you know, for millennia without them. I just want to say that. Um, and, you know, that every use doesn't have to be perpetuated through some substitute. I'm just going to say that. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm the, the meany former regulator. Um, so. Lynn, uh, thank you so you. much for your comments and You're your welcome. perspective. Really, really appreciate. You've said a lot of important things. Um, Irva, why don't we go to you next? You have your hand up as well. Sure. Um, yeah, I just um, <laughs> want to just mention that this issue of the clinician dismissiveness, I mean, I, I agree with you, Lynn, that, <clears throat> that there aren't a lot of choices of what can the clinician do, but, but the um, sort of absolute ignorance, not by any fault of the clinicians themselves, but you know, our entire uh, medical education um, ha has just, you know, pushed environmental <laughs> and occupational exposures so far into the, the margins. Uh, I, I went in, had some, I guess it was elevated li liver enzymes, and I, <clears throat> uh, I my, my, my provider, you know, decided to do a bunch of tests, and, you know, I, I suggested to her that there were there was something in particular in my home uh, uh, that I thought might have contributed to it, which was a short-lived um, potential big exposure, um, uh, not PFAS, but actually I think it was BPA or something. And uh, her response was, "Well, if you hear hooves, do you think zebras, or do you think horses?" You know, it was like. There was just no getting through uh, to her, but um, anyway. So uh, yeah, the dismissiveness is 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 um, it, it's very unfortunate, and it's it's uh, you know it's like, well, where do I go? Um, and you know, of course, all the standard tests didn't show anything um, uh, for for uh, a reason. Um, 
I, you know, I think it would be helpful, and I didn't get this from any of the of the. I, I guess maybe there were hints of it in in the presentations. A really, really excellent presentations of the four presenters. But um, one question I have is the relative contribution from um, consumer products like nonstick pans or um, you know a lot of the sort of home uses um, versus the drinking water and and air you know um, from landfills and so forth. Um, and I'm also interested in. I, di I didn't hear. I heard. Yes, the legacy compounds in the in the long chain are are more ha have longer half lives. But are they decades and decades? Um, and I I ask that because um, um, you know I I'm seeing things in family members that that I that I can't quite explain. Um, uh, and and I'm wondering if it dates back to you know, things in our household from years, from really, really three, four decades ago. Is that, is that possible or not? Um, and then, and then the last thing I just want to say, you know, after yesterday's discussion about the Superfund program, I went and went to the, their website and I was looking at a lot of the things that have been, are being done, um, including mediation, uh, uh, mediation uh, through, uh, for example, planting, uh, poplar saplings, which absorb the, uh, I don't even remember exactly which chemical it was from, um, from soil and, and, and help to clean up um, some areas. And, you know, are there, is there research going on right now um, for medical interventions where people can actually get rid of, of, of their body burdens of, um, of, of the, the longer lived, um, uh, uh, PFAS, uh, compounds. So those are my questions. And, uh, thanks very much though, for, for those, all of those presentations. I, I'm, uh, I really have a better appreciation of, of, of this issue now. Thank but you Chuck, very can much, I... Irva. Yeah, Jane, I was going to say, I think there are a couple of follow-ups maybe from both Lynn and, and um, Irva's questions. Jane, I think certainly for you, and I'm and I'm wondering, Kevin, if, if you wanted to make a response to as well, um, given the comments that have been made about the um, clinician education. So, um, to, so we're doing a study in Bladen County, which is the poorest county in North Carolina. And so we are, we're ready, we're about ready to share our, our results. And it's exciting that we can do it in the context of the National Academy report. But the health director of Bladen County is like, these people, there are no physicians here. How are you going to do this? And so I think it's a real challenge is that we're working with the state and local health departments to figure out how to communicate, um, getting information out. And, and I think that I think that's a gap that, you know, NIHS potentially could help or ATSCR help really do that training and even where to go. So, um, so that's one. The half-life, we actually have done a lot of work um, on half-life, Irva. And, you know, so the half-lives of these chemicals could be like two to seven years mostly. So not DDT length, but since exposure has been relatively constant for such a long period of time, um, that's why they still persist. So, um, so we've been trying to figure out ways that we can model half-lives given what we know about the chemical consistency, the self, you know, so that we could make inferences about the future. But, um, and I'd be interested to see how the ATSDR modeling to back calculate fits in with all of that. Um, so relative contribution is a really interesting challenge because like where I'm working, it, it was all the water. And so like pizza boxes don't, aren't super important. And we have a paper under review where we worked with the people in Colorado who also have a time sensitive R21. And we tried to, um, tried to use various source apportionment models to see if we could get fingerprints. And we could see distinct fingerprints in our sample that related to both fluoroether was one and legacy were another. And then in Colorado, they could break out AFFF from other things. But then when we applied the same methods to NHANES, we didn't see that. And so I think NHANES is a good background level, but I think to really figure out the relative contributions 
it really depends on, I mean, if you're in a highly exposed area, the relative contributions of other things are less important. Um, but one of the things we don't know now and is the advice is like, well, don't drink the water, but you can shower in it. And does that, is that really, is that really valid? So more things to chew on, less answers. <laughs> Thank you, Jane. And um, thanks. Yeah, go ahead, Kevin. I'll just be be really quick. I, I appreciated your uh, the affirmation that these issues of medical education are important to address. I would just note, I appreciate Liam um, put a comment uh, in the uh, chat about some of the things that NIEHS is doing. It sounds really interesting. They're pediatric and reproductive environmental health scholars. But you know, one thing that strikes me is that may be really great education for a small number of people. I'm really curious, you know, how to provide the kind of incentives for kind of broadly based education. And I don't have all the answers. You know, when I hear from some folks in the medical field, they note that to actually provide the incentives for medical schools to do a better job with this, you know, maybe this kind of information needs to be in the board exams so that they know they have to get it in there. And so I'm not sure if this community knows how to provide that pressure to get this into the board exams and so on. Um, or if there are other things that the NIHS can be do and other government agencies working with the broader NIH and so on. But I think I, I'd love to see some more brainstorming on how to address this because it seems like a longstanding issue. Thanks for that, Kevin. Gary Miller, you've got your hand up. Yeah, I mean, so there's I have three sort of items. One is, and maybe NECRI is a way to address this. We do have to get better at measuring these things from a research perspective, right? We just need better analytical techniques to pick up the range. But when you start thinking about clinical care, as Lynn pointed out, you have to have these CLIA certified tests to be done. And these are not trivial things to do. And a doctor can't do anything if it's not a CLIA approved test. So I think as part of the long-term strategy, there should be a plan to get lab core and quest to get some sort of PFAS test there, because hopefully the type of research being done will say, hey, if you have a high level of exposure of PFAS, maybe you should be on a statin or something. But the doctor can't order the test if the test isn't in the, the CLIA certified list and it, so that can be picked for that. And so, and it's just something that it, unless they know it's gonna be a coded and reimbursable expense, I, you're not going to go back and retrain the doctors, but if someone comes in and say, hey, can you test me for this chemical? And they go, oh, yeah, it's on a list, check it, order it. Whether or not they know what to do with it, that's a whole separate issue. But I, I think there has to be a strategy for getting more environmental chemicals CLIA certified. Yeah, thanks, Gary. Um, Chris, on to you. Great discussion. I have a, a couple of points related to that. First, as a follow up to Gary, mm -hmm. it, when we had a uh, a brief out with NASM before the report went public, and we had a list of things that we talked about, and and some of these issues around CLIA tests and and how do people order tests and who pays for them are health equity issues, and 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 you know we have some real concerns about. How, that, how you implement a recommendation like that from a health equity standpoint. Insurance companies are not paying for these. They're not cheap, even when you can get them ordered. And most physicians, if you go to them and say, I want a PFAS test, they have no idea what it is and where to go. And you know, sometimes they'll come to us. We have pediat pediatric environmental health specialty units in each of the 10 federal regions. We point them there, but many times, depending on which pesos you're talking about, uh, they may not know where there are labs in their area. So it, it's really a, a tough issue. And, you know, when we, a lot of our work is practical, it's in the field. And so when we complete a study and provide communities with their results, they're getting a piece of paper or a derby report. And, and we say, take it to your doctor. And before we release that data, we go into the communities and do physician education around PFAS. But it, you know, it's a struggle because first, they don't have a knowledge base 
from their uh, uh, regular college education. So you're talking about something that's completely foreign to them. You know, you spend most of the time trying to get them to understand that PFAS is per and polyfluoroalkylated substances. And there's some that we know about, and there's, some, there's a lot that we don't know about. And, and then you got to get them to show up. And if we don't get the, the continuing education uh, credits for this, and we, and we have people who work with the people who grant that uh, to do that, it, it's, it's, it's a tough sell. And so, you know, we, we, we feel like we're lucky if we get 50% of the physician community and, and then getting them to, you know, what we're relying on is our community action panels, our, our people on the ground in the, in the areas to reach out to their doctors and to, to say, can you participate in this seminar? And, and, but, you know, at the end of the day, we get, you know, we're lucky we get a couple of hours. Worth. And so it, it's a huge health equity issue that is going to take a combined effort. and. And and I and it's hard to get my head around, but I know it needs to be done. <laughs> and, and 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 when you talk about ordering up tests, you know we don't have threshold limits. You know, I, I started my career in occupational health. I'm an industrial hygienist by training, and uh, uh, you know, in industrial hygiene, you have a threshold limit, and if it's above a threshold limit, you you kind of know what you do. But the points of departure for developing health standards for PFAS continue to go down. And you know, I, I remember being in a, a meeting with Linda Beerbaum and she said to me, one part per trillion, that's what it should be, and, which seemed right at the time in my opinion, but now we're talking quadrillions. <laughs> uh, uh, and so as, these, as the points of departure keep going down, uh, uh, it makes all, it, it makes this all even more difficult. And then, you know, on one hand, we say drinking water is a big component, but as if our safe exposure levels keep going down, um, maybe other things like the liner in your pizza box become germane. It, it, uh, because we're eventually, I think, and I'm, I'm, a, I'm a glass half full person, that we're, we're going to get the remediation technologies right and and be able to help people out who have contaminated drinking water. I'm I'm hoping that occurs in my lifetime. And uh, 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 and, and if that does occur, and we may find ourselves in a situation where some of these what we think today are minor exposures may not necessarily be as minor as we once thought. Well, thanks for those additional thoughts, Chris. I felt like all of this was enormously complex, and and now I'm thinking you just added a few dimensions to that. So, <laughs> Rick, you've got a question or a comment? Yeah, just a quick comment, and that's I'm going to direct it at Chris. Um, in your presentation, you, you know, at ATSDR, you look at places like the NIH, you know, the DTT, you know, EPA, other places for knowledge. I mean, this is a highly complex problem with so many different facets. Uh, you know, we have Jeep and we have all these different organizations, everyone's stepping forward to organize it, but are we tripping over each other or are we actually organizing things centrally? Uh, but the one thing I noticed that you never mentioned the NTP. So I was just curious, uh, what role do you see that the NTP plays in addressing some of the challenges going forward? Yeah, so we, you know, we work closely with the NTP at ATSDR and, and, you know, Bill Sabulis, who's still with us after years, still is, and, and Pat Ricey, my boss, are, are still engaged with them. And, and, and we have constant communication as to how we can use each other to better uh, uh, push this forward. But, you know, it, it, that's just one example of this bigger effort that uh, how do we coordinate, even as a federal family, which could be an easy first step. Um, uh, you know, we work closely with NIHS, with NTP, with EPA, but USDA has a place in this. FDA has a place in this. Um, because of the nature of where the pollution is, we have to, you know, we talk with the VA and the DOD on this uh, uh, because, 
at the end of the day, the DODs, one of the biggest polluters in the VA are the people that pick up the pieces uh, uh, once the soldiers, once our soldiers and airmen and, and sailors leave service. And, and, but we are tripping over, I think we are tripping over each other. And, 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 and you know, in the prior administration, OMB tried to take a role of bringing everybody together to coordinate as a federal family. And I see Lynn laughing because it, it, it was laughable. Um, uh, uh, and, 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 and it's, we, we talk, I'll give you my opinion. And 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 because this is a passion for me, we talk at each other and not with each other. It, it reminds me many times of my teenage kids when they were teenagers, and um and and there's a lot. We're all trying to get our piece of the pie, and and again, this is not ATSDR speaking. This is Chris Ray speaking, but we're all trying to get our piece of the pie and hold on to it and promote our programs when we should really. To your point, Rick, and it's a great point. We should really be coming together. Um, uh, you know, if you guys are looking at PFAS 2.0 and we're looking at PFAS 2.0, why don't we look at it together? And and uh, uh, I think there'd be much more power in that than us individually doing. You know, Chris, great. Thanks for those comments. And just stay tuned. We have to do a better job coordinating solutions amongst federal agencies. And actually, as the director of the NTP, uh, I'm going to be stepping in and being more proactive on this. Uh, we have an executive committee for the NTP that has represent you and others representatives uh, from different federal agencies. But uh, I mean, there there are no specific projects that are quote NTP <laughs> projects that go across <laughs> multiple federal agencies dealing with some of the pressing issues with PFAS. We got to fix that. Happy to engage. Happy to. Uh, Daryl, I think this brings us to you. Uh, you're on mute, Daryl. Quite often am on mute. Oh. <laughs> Whether I want to be or not. <laughs> uh, right. Yeah. Uh, great talks. Um, just wanted to make a little point um, with regard to Brian's um, comments and, and his question. And it brings me back to um, Phil Landrigan's opening comments last month at the um, Academy's um, workshop, Children's Environmental Health, where he put forth the proposition that, hey, we can't just sit around and do nothing anymore. And Brian asked the question as it relates to, um, should, you know, uh, should we do anything? Yes, from a DTT's perspective. And I think that that's um, relevant. And I think that um, the question, because this is a snowball going downhill right now as it relates to these PFAS compounds. Um, and even more importantly, their interaction with the disinfectant related byproducts that um, are uh, produced um, you know, at the um, water treatment facilities. So if you have a concentration gradient going downhill from a point source, um, that's that then um, breaches, for an example, um, an inlet at a water treatment facility. Um, and then you have these disinfectant byproducts and um, PFAS compounds mixing and getting into the drinking water supply of a municipality then that's uh, a, a case and a formula for disaster. And that's what's going on right now in America, um, in several places. And so um, to um, Gary, yes, um, we have labs they can that are clear certified. And in these communities, primarily federally qualified health centers are there. These individuals are seeking their services at a, a fairly qualified health center. And so I think that's something uh, and somewhere where we can look to um, for that regulation that you're speaking of. But all in all, um, there are so many social and ethical issues um, that are at the forefront now with respect to the compounds that we just um, discussed. And so I, I'm, I'm, I would hope that we'd be able to address them in, in short order. Thank you. Yeah, Rick, you were there. Yeah, Rick was there, um, I think, um, on that. Um, conference 
Oh, was that New York? I can't remember. Now. <laughs> yeah, I think it was. That was the uh, the 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 Mount Sinai conference. Yeah, that we also brought it up there as well. Yep. Yeah. yeah, I remember it when you brought mm -hmm. it up there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks. Thank you, Daryl. Um, Trevor. Uh, so I, I'd like to make about three three different points. The first point I'd like to make is, is reinforce what's already been said about the lack of medical education when it comes to environmental health and occupational health. And uh, rather than retrace all of that, the ideas I have would be that maybe, first of all, NIOSH and NIHS could work together on new training programs in this area. Second, uh, uh, NIHS or NIH itself could take a leadership role in actually influencing the American Association of Medical Colleges to actually inform them about the need to have education in this area in the hopes that by influencing AAMC, we could affect the medical licensing exam and the boards. And uh, with the long-term goal, <laughs> to be able to take effective exposure histories of individuals. If we could take effective exposure histories and actually have them part of the electronic health record, we have an enormous inroad into the Exposomics initiative that NIHS and other ICs want to implement. My other point is, I think, that what I'm hearing is, is that we have some challenges when it comes to exposomics. The first challenge is if you take a subject like P PFAS, we've heard today that the number of chemicals keep growing. So it provides an analytical challenge just to measure these compounds alone, let alone the entire exposome when it comes to chemical exposure. So it's a challenge for us. The second challenge that I picked up on is the issue of health equity. If we are able to actually provide or ways of measuring the exposome, are we going to actually uh, make health inequities even greater because it comes to the expense of doing this and who will have access? So I think they're all the points I, I would like to make. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Trevor. Um, all very important points. Um, I'm j given given the points you just made. I'm just curious, David, if there's anything you wanted to say in in response to some of his comments, or should I just keep going? I, I think let's keep going. I have a lot of thoughts in my in my head, but okay. uh, yeah, we we, we want to hear from council members. Great. Okay. Um, thank you again, Trevor. Janet, got your hand up. Um, David, does that mean I shouldn't speak up? <laughs> no, no, no. You're welcome <laughs> no, Jan, to speak up, Jan. <laughs> um, I, I, I really want to um, dilate a little bit on um, things that I know have been discussed a little bit here that um, Dr. Elliott definitely brought up in his talk um, relating to medical education. Um, I, I think that the specialty needs a rebranding. I think that um, the idea of occupational brings this into a whole different level than environment, and I don't know if they should be separated, or maybe we take the occupational out of the specialty, um, because I think that that as somebody growing up in medicine and being in medicine forever, um, occupational medicine for me means insurance physicals for back pain. Um, and, you know, I, I don't mean to offend, I'm just sort of telling you that I don't think that the environment piece of that has really gotten out there. Um, I also think that there are ways in which um, professional societies can be leveraged because they're often the ones that know how to work within that clinical environment of um, changing diagnostic codes, of thinking about testing, about bringing together 
um, various different experts in the field to standardize testing, um, and including the CDC and including people that, that come from here. So I think that there really is a lot that can be done. Definitely double AMC. Um, and then working with ABIM, which is the Internal Medicine Accrediting Board and similar pediatric boards, um, there is a way forward. It's not going to happen quickly, but I think that we are at a point where if we really believe that the environment is important to our health, we, we really need to have a concerted effort to think about that. Anyway, I, I'd appreciate um, any feedback that you might have on those ideas. Yeah, thanks a lot, Jan, for adding to that. I think um, a plan is starting to form here based on, on some of the comments that have been made, which is pretty exciting. Um, Chris, can I just check in with Kevin for a second? Because Kevin, I saw your hand up and then it go down. Was there something you wanted to add or say? Yeah, I just really, well, so I really appreciate everybody's ideas about the issue of, of medical education. I think it's it would be exciting to explore some of these things, but I just wanted to amplify um, one of the points Trevor made about health equity, because I think that's another issue that, that personally, I'm especially concerned about, you know, these kinds of tests for PFAS are not cheap. And, you know, there's still complexities as to how often, you know, health insurance will cover the people who don't have health insurance, um, reaching those who may not have regular access to a primary care, um, you know, clinician. And so, you know, I don't know if this is the right group to, to solve these problems, but I just want to highlight those that I really do think they're important. Um, ethical and social issues that we need to be thinking about that that partly went beyond the scope of this report, but that I think are really important um, to be thinking about. Yeah, terrific, Kevin. Thank you. Uh, Chris, on to you. So, you know, I just wanted to follow up to what Janet said about uh, environmental versus occupational. I've worked on both sides of the fence. Uh, uh, and, you know, we we have found over the past few years, especially with PFAS, partnering with NIOSH has been uh, very valuable. And we, you know, we talk the same language. You know, you wherever they say occupational, you could add in environmental, and it's just, you know, you're talking the same language. And it's this, it's, I, 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 we find a lot of richness in, in when ATSDR and NIOSH are together on PFAS and talking about our work. And we've been able to uh, uh, help each other out. Uh, I'm trying to think of the right word. That's not the right word, but that's what comes to mind, uh, to help each other out and to facilitate each other's work. And we share information together. And, and you know, I've had a, a couple of situations where I've been in meetings where people know that I used to work at NIOSH and they'll say, will you represent NIOSH in this? And I, I usually say no, uh, because I, I think, why don't you just, have them come to the come to the table because that whole side is is important too and 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 we we've got to can we got to include that in the discussions. Yeah, thanks, Chris. Rick, did you want to follow up on that? Well, just a, a quick comment here about uh, education. I mean, I, and I think as most of you know, I I've, I've been working hard just trying to bring greater consciousness to you know, the IC directors across the NIH and other parts of the biomedical research enterprise that, uh, that environmental exposures can affect health. It's it just, <laughs> I haven't heard Tony Fauci once actually go out and to comment that the differential responses to SARS-CoV-2 may be related to environmental exposures. And we have tangible evidence now. I mean, Chris, you know, you you uh, you you were talking about this. There may be an effect on. So the the leadership within the institutes have to be uh, aware of this and embrace this, and then take this, and this can then uh, kind of trickle into the rest of the biomedical research enterprise. Um, but if the leadership isn't is just doesn't think that it's important it's going to be a big challenge uh, with education. Thank you, Rick. Um, Tim Greenemeyer, you had your hand up at one point and then put it down. I just want to check in with you to see if there was something you wanted to say or share. 
Yeah, I just wanted to put a, a finer point on the training of physicians. I think the, the specialized training programs that were brought up are great, but I think the, the training has to be much more broad-based oh, and okay. earlier. That's and I think it has to start at a minimum in medical school for uh, students. It, it's not easy to, to get these things in the curriculum when uh, already existing programs are fighting over how many lectures they get in, in medical school. Uh, but I think it's, it's an important goal. Well, thanks for sharing that finer point, Tim. Appreciate that. Anything else on anybody's mind? Any of the speakers want to say something that they feel has been left unsaid? Well, I think one of the things that I think about and kind of the equity issues is that we know that everybody in the Cape Fear Basin is at high risk of being highly exposed. And do we need to recommend testing all those people for PFAS or should we just move them into the healthcare model? And I think ultimately we're gonna be more effective if we can have better predictive models. Like, oh, if you've lived here, you're more likely and you should get your thyroid tested because I think ultimately to implement, I mean, the, there's not enough labs to test everybody who would fall into the exposed category. So I don't think that we should wait for that. Thank you, Jane. Um, Brian, I saw your hand pop up. Thanks, Michelle. I, I, in listening to this conversation, it just builds, as you noted earlier, builds on the layers of, um, of of how much complexity there is in this 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 challenge, and it and it brings to mind the um, the 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 comment the adage that is often attributed to Einstein. If I had an hour, I'd spend fifty five minutes to defining the problem. I think this is a place where we really need a problem definition phase um, that is much more proactive than than probably we've had, and in particular one that is a prioritized problem definition. To Chris's point, there's lots of conversation going on. There are lots of strategies and research plans being developed, but, but it's looking across those plans and really identifying the key things that we need to deliver, even the clinical capability stuff. At the end of the day, even if you develop the test and train the clinicians, what to do with that information is still a pretty significant gap. If you look at the, uh, the NASM report, most of the recommendations were pretty much aligned with common medical practice today. They were not specifically driven by exposure levels. They are things that are already being done. You just pay particular attention to them because they are relevant to this particular problem. So I, I really think we as a community need to have some significant focus on problem definition and prioritization, and then ultimately find, determine who's gonna solve some of those parts of the problem. Thanks for that, Brian. Lynn, your hands up. Yes, I mean, I was gonna suggest that this um, issue could be the perfect issue to really put the mission of the National Toxicology Program to the test. Uh, Rick mentioned that earlier, Dr. Wojcik. I, you know, we have heard not only about um, exposures in communities, but also, you know, exposures related to consumer products, food-related exposures, um, food packaging, food um, food surfaces, FDA, and I, I know FDA has a representative who's observing this, but certainly has a role. Um, EPA, not only the research, but also the toxics program itself, which has taken on the PFAS as a priority um, group of chemicals. And um, NIOSH, somebody mentioned OSHA, the worker exposures are substantial when you consider that how um, these um, um, substances end up in water is from discharge from manufacturing facilities. Folks are people inside those facilities, you know, who are exposed. And there are people who are involved with taking those chemicals that are manufactured and turning them into other products. They, they don't come off um, the chemical production line as Teflon. They're sold um, to another company that makes it into Teflon and they wind up uh, many of them in applications where there's quite a bit of exposure, such as being sprayed on, you know, to auto bodies or sprayed on to other 
um, in, in other um, contexts where the control for the exposures is not what it is in a chemical manufacturing plant. Absolutely. And so I, I do think that, you know, this, this it calls for a government-wide approach, uh, can't afford to have different agencies all doing the same thing over and over and over again. Uh, to trust each other's work. If, if one does a hazard assessment, everybody use it. That would be a novel concept. That's what the NTP is supposed to be doing. And, and to, to really see if the government can actually um, coordinate effectively, you know, given, that, um, given the magnitude of this. Um, and, and I go back to the EPA. Um, it, it has authorities that it could use when it comes to the newer ones that are coming on the market to serve as substitutes and um, any way possible that it can do that rather than the way that that is investigated is through it's already in people's drinking water and in their bodies. That is not the way to manage new chemicals. I've said enough, but um, I, I think it's an opportunity and, and I, hope, I hope that the government can, um, can make that work. And I realize we're just advising um, the research at the NIEHS and not the NTP itself, but perhaps this could be taken, um, um, Rick, to your advisory committee for the NTP to think about this. Thank you very much, Lynn. I saw Chris up there with his hand up for a while and then he disappeared. Chris, yeah, Lynn, yeah, Lynn and Brian made the exact same point I was going to make, so I'm oh. not going to pile on. <laughs> okay, <laughs> sounds fine. Any last comments or questions anybody has before I turn it back to David? Oh, here, Kevin, go ahead. Just one other point I might make um, yes. from my more philosophical perspective um, is that, you know, it, it just strikes me that you have so many chemicals in this class that, you know, there's always the temptation, I feel like, to try to really drill down and get, you know, detailed information so we can make really good decisions. But uh, just back to the issue of uncertainty, it seems like we have so many chemicals here we're dealing with that we really need to be exploring ways of grouping them, trying to get, you know, sort of knowledge so that we can handle things in, you know, rather than at an individual chemical level. And so I, I just love to see further exploration of that you know it may not provide we may not always be able to get the precise scientific information we'd like but um it could really help with um you know quicker decision making when we're dealing with uncertainty and trying to uh, protect people thank you kevin thanks for that last last word david let me pass it back to you Thank you, Michelle. I'm just going to take the ball for for a second and and thank everybody for for their engagement in in this conversation in in today's discussion and and also yesterday. Uh, and then I'm going to pass the ball back over to to Rick as our our formal chair uh, to to close things out. Okay, terrific. Well, thanks, uh, David. And I will take my virtual gavel. And, but before I do that, I want to thank everyone who has been actively involved in uh, preparing for the uh, a very successful council. Uh, actually, using the Victor McCusick used to say at uh, the summer summer courses at the Jackson Laboratory, the best yet. And I think that's uh, another another uh, example. The uh, the council this time around was uh, was really insightful. And I really appreciate that. And it's great to get comments, for example, from, from Lynn Golden. But I will take these comments back to the Executive Committee of the National Toxicology Program. So uh, thanks to everyone. And thanks especially to the council members who it takes a lot of time and effort uh, to engage, not only to spend time with us, but to prepare for these meetings. And uh, so, David, anyone else that we need to just openly thank? Uh, of course, we have Nathan Michener and all of his colleagues that make it possible for us to do this uh, virtually. And Liz McDare, who always provides you know, fabulous uh, preparation and materials to keep us all uh, working in sync with each other. Uh, any Anyone else specifically we should be noting? And of course, Pat Maston, I'm just looking across the, the Zoom here. Yeah, Pat has been the the mastermind behind keeping, you know, putting together the agendas and, uh, you know, getting everything prepped up uh, so that we have productive meetings. But David, any anything else that I'm missing? 
Um, yeah, I, I think the only other specific person to call out is Rose, but really, I mean, it, it, it takes a village, um, you know, and, and so, you know, every, everybody in DERT and, and, and the staff in your office have a role that they, they, they are playing in, in getting this done. So, so we recognize all of their contributions, but there's too many people to call out by name. Okay. Well, with that, I will take my virtual gavel and bang, bang, bang. And this uh, council session is now formally adjourned.